for the sake of the University of Buenos Aires, and <laughs> since we are hosting this event in Argentina. And then I'm going to switch to English for a proper introduction. Bueno, hola a todos y todas. Eh, gracias por estar presentes en un día tan particular para un evento académico, un domingo. Eh, el año pasado, en un esfuerzo conjunto de la cátedra Ilia Rada, de Taller de Teoría y Filosofía Política, el Centro Italo Argentino Altos Estudios de la UBA y la Carrera de Ciencia Política, logramos invitar a Gianfranco Vascuino, a nuestra querida Facultad de Ciencias Sociales. Y este año, en medio de la pandemia que nos asola, las posibilidades de armar eventos académicos eh, en un principio se fueron diluyendo. Pero la reconfiguración hacia una nueva modalidad de trabajo nos abrió nuevas puertas y sobre todo la ayuda constante de la carrera de ciencia política con esa alguien de rosas a la cabeza eh, que facilitó toda la estructura y soporte virtual para estar acá hoy con un montón de invitados internacionales de las mejores universidades del mundo eh, para dedicarnos a la figura que vamos a tratar hoy que es Nofonte. ¿Por qué Ciro y por qué Genofonte? El COVID nos ha enfrentado con cuestiones sanitarias, económicas, sociales, eh, pero también nos abrió una puerta para un fuerte debate sobre el lugar, sobre el gobierno y los gobernantes. Eh, sobre cómo los diferentes líderes políticos deben sortear o sortean las diferentes crisis y clivajes a los que nos vamos enfrentando. Eh, y Genofonte es sin duda el autor que más se ha abocado a esta cuestión de la antigüedad. Y en Ciro encuentra una figura excepcional que le vale su libro más extenso, la Ciropedia. Y tanto es así que el impacto que ha tenido en la posteridad, en el pensamiento de Maquiavelo, eh, en el renacimiento inglés, eh, lo ha hecho una figura prominente. Eh, y justamente como investigadores lo que tenemos que hacer es preguntarnos por las características de este, de este líder, Ciro, eh, y también por la imagen que el autor quiere dar de él. Eh, así que eso es precisamente lo que vamos a debatir hoy. Eh, desde diferentes interpretaciones y perspectivas. Hay quienes ven a Ciro como un líder ideal, hay quienes ven en Ciro un ejemplo completamente negativo, hay quienes encuentran en su figura un modelo ambivalente. Así que a eso nos dedicaremos las próximas dos horas más o menos. Y de vuelta les agradezco a todos y todas, todos eh, que pasar ahora al inglés. So, well, uh, now I'm going uh, to speak in English, dear colleagues and friends. Uh, it is great to meet you, at least in this way, in this time of distress. Uh, a moment not only marked by the dreadful COVID pandemic, but also by the moral effectiveness and qualities of different leaders around the world. And this is precisely what we are going to discuss today through the fi uh, figure of Cyrus in the Cyropedia. This is perhaps the most, the classical text that address the practicalities of leadership and how to rule the most. And I'm, when I was thinking about this little introduction, first I thought about providing a view of our key speaker and the commenters and the special guests. But given that they are all well-known experts on their field, <coughs> and that most of us have met each other, I do prefer just to introduce them by their names and affiliations. Uh, David Johnson, Southern Illinois University Carbondale, Gabriel Dancing, Barilan University, Claudia Marsico, University of Buenos Aires, Norman Sandridge, Howard University, Sean Exposito, Until the COVID Crisis, University of North uh, Carolina at Greensboro, Gabriela Rodríguez, Eugenio Matei, and Agustín Volco from the University of Buenos Aires. Luis André Dorion, uh, he's not here, uh, but he was expected from University of Montreal. The same goes for Helen Millender, Reed College. Sara Brown Ferrario, the Catholic University of America. Uh, and Melina Tamiolaki, which also is not here, sadly, unfortunately, from University of Crete. And Fiorenza Bevilacqua, she's retired, retired from the University of Perugia. So we, are, uh, we also have the pleasure to count with the virtual presence of other distinguished and dear colleagues. Uh, Chris Farrell was going to be here, Odid Haim, Rowena Fowler, uh, Young Gritu, Maria Santu, Chris Williams, 
Luis Felipe Van Chim, uh, Gregory McBriar, Vladimir Zuckerman, and Shane Haygood. I think that some of them get lost uh, in the middle of the trying to get into the Cisco meeting. And before starting this debate or workshop, just a few words about the inception. Oh, please uh, uh, try to silence the microphones, especially the ones who didn't have a headset, please. Uh, I was saying that before starting the debate, uh, just a few words about its inception. The University of Buenos Aires has a weekly permanent seminar on Xenophon and the Socratics, supervised by Claudia Marsico, who is here, and I, uh, composed by scholars at different times in their careers, professors and researchers, postdocs, PhD students, AIM students, and from different backgrounds, such as law, classics, literature, history, philosophy, and political science. We even have a small branch in Calgary, thanks to Lorraine Campbell, that lends Laura Milman to us a couple of hours per week. Uh, last year, we devote ourselves to reread the Cyropedia, and Dave's paper generated a quite lively debate uh, between us, uh, because he's one of the few non strassian scholars that argues that Xenophon show us Cyrus as a negative example. So we thought, uh, why not to discuss this with Dave, Dave and other friends around the world? And since our group has a lot of young students and the early stages of their careers, why not to create a space to allow them to present their comments and questions? And here we are now. And so since everybody has already read uh, David's paper, uh, this, will go, this will go as it follows. First, Dave is going to summarize some of his arguments and give us his new thoughts on the matter. Secondly, the commenters, uh, Gabriel and Claudia, in that order. Uh, Noreen Campbell was going to be a commenter, but she has a, a family emergency uh, right, right now. She wrote to me just a few minutes ago. Uh, and Gabriel and Claudia will pre present their own view on Dave's paper. Thirdly, our special guest will have the privilege of being the first in asking questions. And fourthly, there will be an open Q&I session and debate, giving a special attention to students, and for example, the students of our seminar, and also uh, some of our special guests have already sent some of their questions to David. So maybe we can address that firstly. And so thanks again for being here on Sunday. And let's begin. Uh, Dave, uh, you have the word now. Thank, thank you again, all of you. Uh, thank you. Um, everybody hear me more or less? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so uh, I'll now rattle off this document that I've, I've also shared a uh, link um, uh, for any of whom that would be useful to follow the text. Um, so I'd like to thank uh, Rodrigo, uh, I think, uh, for honoring me with an, an invitation to discuss an article not only before a gifted student of graduate, a gifted set of graduate students who have been studying the Cyropedia intensively and are therefore primed with keen questions, but alongside a number of scholars who have contributed considerably more to our understanding of the Cyropedia than I have. It is thus my fervent hope that our debate will not consist in a doomed effort on my part to defend my article against all comers, but an open conversation about the text that my article merely serves to get underway. As is true of the Cyropedia itself, my plan can be read in a darker or at least more self-serving way, and as much as it will lessen my opportunity to make a fool of myself, mm -hmm. but also in a more generous and philanthropic light is aimed at the greater good of a better informed and wiser conversation about the text. And in, the, and in this instance, I will insist on the positive reading, and justly enough, as my goal will not be to dominate the conversation, but to no more rule than be ruled. Speaking of positive readings, the burden of proof for readings of the Cyropidea should certainly lie on those who, like me, 
argue for a more negative reading of the text. The opening of the text contains some complexities, which I tried to exploit in my article, but the most read is clearly that Cyrus is the solution to the single most important problem raised by Xenophon's writings, the problem of leadership. How can one justify a more skeptical reading? Here's a quick account of how I've tried to do so. The most obvious in for a negative reading comes in the last chapter of the text, as you all know. At Kauri Idea 882, we are suddenly told that everything started to take a turn for the worse the moment Cyrus died. Cyrus had taken a great number of steps to put his empire on a permanent basis and made an effort to reconcile his sons to one another. These arrangements failed, or at least began to fail at once, which calls for some explanation. And there are several explanations available. One is Vivian Gray's use of Xenophon's defense of Socrates' involvement with Alcibiades and Critias in the memorabilia. Xenophon argues there in the memorabilia that teachers are not to be held responsible for the flaws of their students once they leave their teachers behind, an argument that is dear to the heart of every teacher. The major flaw with Gray's use of this argument is that Xenophon makes no such defense of Cyrus in the Sarapidea. Readers would have to import it entirely from the memorabilia. Now, I too read across Xenophon's corpus, including by importing insights from the Socratica into the Sarapidea. So it would be hypocritical of me to rule out any such transfers. But this would be a particularly strange case, it seems to me, one where Xenophon launches an open broadside against the legacy of his protagonist, offers no defense whatsoever, and expects readers to defend that protagonist entirely via things said in other works. Another flaw with Gray's argument, I believe, is that Xenophon claims in the memorabilia that Alcibiades and Critias were corrupted when they left their teacher and took to associating, to associating with unsavory types. Alcibiades with besotted aristocratic ladies and powerful men who wanted him as an ally, Critias by Thessalian lowlifes. But who ruined the Persian elite? After Cyrus died, only other Persian elites, I take it, all beneficiaries of the same regimen Cyrus had established for his court. It's hard to shift the blame for corruption to someone else if you've corrupted everyone. Another explanation of 8.8, more simply asserts that Persian decline after the fall of Cyrus is a reverse proof of his superb leadership. Cyrus is introduced as an exceptional leader, so little surprise if his successors fell short and Persia declined accordingly. But the decline in Persian mores, as Xenophon depicts it, is absolutely catastrophic. It would be hard to maintain that the Persians were better off after Cyrus than before him, at least as Xenophon depicts things. If this is what an exceptional leader can accomplish, I'll take a pass. So I do think that 8.8 is a problem for what is otherwise the natural positive reading of the Cyropidea, but it's also a problem for any negative reading. For if we are to regard the Cyropidea as a coherent whole, we need evidence from within the work to show that 8.8 isn't just an afterthought that Xenophon failed to integrate into the text as a whole, unless we are to throw our hands up and call it an interpolation. Such evidence from the Cyropidea isn't easy to find, for Cyrus is almost always successful in everything he undertakes, and almost always the recipient of praise from others in the narrative. I have argued, however, that we do find at least two other ideals within the Cyropidea. The first is the egalitarian regime of old Persia, egalitarian at least among the elite peers, that is, with its limited monarchy. The second is the romantic ideal of Panthea, the most beautiful woman in all of Asia, and her husband, Abradatus. My argument was, and I suppose it still is, that if we are to admire old Persia and the beautiful couple, this must lessen our admiration for Cyrus. To take Panthea first, she, for her part, all but curses Cyrus 
shortly before killing yourself in words I take to show that there is something fundamentally hollow about service to Cyrus. I argued that Cyrus did not only not trust himself around her before she was a widow, but failed to understand her until the very end. I said rather more in my article about the decline of old Persia in the form of the transformation of the Persian peers into Cyrus's centaurs. Since I am among friends, I will admit that it still strikes me as rash to claim that Xenophon depicted the introduction of cavalry amongst the Persians as a sign of decline, given Xenophon's own obvious interest in cavalry and horsemanship. I have to read my paper over again every once in a while to reconvince myself. You've read the paper and been convinced or not, so I won't rehearse the argument in detail here. But my centers are just one sign of a feature I think we'd all recognize in the Syropidea, Cyrus's effort to take the best elements from Persia and media and produce from them a more powerful and successful whole. The hybrid army Cyrus builds is certainly successful in beating the Assyrians, defeating Croesus, capturing Babylon, and building what Xenophon portrays as a world empire, which is no small feat. And in the last chunk of the Syropidea, we see Cyrus attempting to meld Persia and Media into a new hybrid culture, a multi or at least bicultural court and civilization. But there are costs here as well as benefits. The Persian peers, who once fought for praise, content with their equal share from any victory, now race on horseback to get the largest share of the plunder alongside new recruits who did not share the education Xenophon introduced is integral to making these Persian peers a worthy elite in the first place. Or so I tell the tale. I'll wrap up by developing uh, one observation that came to me only recently, though I doubt it is original to me. A great, deal, a great deal hinges, it seems to me, on whether we regard the Syropidea as being a work about leadership or a work about empire. My article largely takes the Syropidea as being a work about empire and imperialism, a largely unargued and implicit assumption, I, I think. I am, I'm happy to admit, not a fan of imperialism. This no doubt colored and colors my response to the Syropidea, for as a fan of Xenophon, I don't like to see him rooting for a system I abhor, even if I am quite aware of the distinct possibility that Xenophon may not have been enlightened and wise enough to share all of my beliefs and values. If one approaches the Syropidea as a work about leadership, however, it is much easier and much safer to read it positively. Xenophon was obviously fascinated by leadership, and I think it is undeniable that there are many positive lessons on leadership in the Syropidea. Leadership is rather more respectable a topic than imperialism. Some of Cyrus's leadership lessons are military lessons, but many, or most, are lessons in diplomacy and hierarchical politics that will have a much wider application. Reasonable readers can disagree about individual episodes, but at bottom, many of the criticisms of Cyrus's behavior rely on unexamined assumptions about the perniciousness of what we regard as manipulation, often a mistranslation of the Greek kraomai, or anxiety about the hierarchical usage of charis, or worries about a leader's resort to deception. Xenophon did not share these assumptions for the most part. So we who are committed to contemporary democratic values like transparency, equality, and autonomy need to be very careful not to criticize Cyrus for actions or traits Xenophon would have, would have considered wise and expedient in a just and hierarchical society led by a virtuous leader. But framing the Syropidea as a work about empire still changes things, I think, both for Xenophon and for us. The book certainly starts out as a work about leadership, but by choosing a leader whose rule extended over such a vast portion of the known world, Xenophon not only chose the clearest counterexample to his initial remarks about the difficulty of ruling human beings, but broached the topic of empire. It makes it clear, he makes it clear at the outset that Cyrus won over some peoples willingly, the Medes and the Hyrcanians, but conquered others. 
The imperial nature of Cyrus's rule then fades for the first half of the book. As Cyrus's empire begins defensively, as all the best empires do, his empire is better still, in fact, because he begins not only by defending his own people, but by defending an ally, media. But Cyrus eventually conquers many peoples by force and makes the Persians rulers of all Asia, founding the Persian Empire, an entity distinct from the Persian throne that Cyrus leaves in his father's hands until his father's death. It is this empire that Cyrus is concerned with securing in the later stages of the Cyropaideia. Now, Xenophon, as I'm sure you all remember, is normally skeptical of differences in scale. The same qualities allow one to rule oneself, deal well with one's friends, and manage a city. We might expect that the same would apply on the imperial scale. The same man can well manage himself, his friendships, his own community, and his empire. I'm not aware, however, of any positive evidence directly addressing this question. Please do share any that comes to mind. Yet Xenophon's antipathy to both Athenian and Spartan imperialism is pretty clear, I believe, which suggests that we ought to be open to the possibility that he would be critical of Persian imperialism as well. Certainly he would have had plenty of Greek company in that regard. Xenophon's opposition to empires is based not only on the injustice of imperial rule, or at least the frequent injustices perpetrated by imperial, imperial rulers, though he is quite aware of that, but on the damage empire does to the imperialists themselves. Chapter 14 of the Spartan Constitution is a very clear case of this on the Spartan side, and here I can be grateful that uh, Noreen Humble isn't here to point out that Spartan's, Sparta's problems did not begin with her overseas empire. Um, in the Athenian case, the Poroi makes it clear that the Athenians risked bankrupting themselves in pursuit of empire when they could have done much better by reorganizing their own economy and society. I will admit, however, that it's less clear to me, now that I've confronted the problem directly, that what Xenophon rejects in these cases is imperialism per se, rather than subpar or vicious imperialists. Still, Xenophon's skepticism about other empires opens up room for us to be concerned about Cyrus as an imperialist, even if most of the Cyropaidea is relentlessly positive about Cyrus as a leader. This is what leads me to think it worth worrying. It is worth worrying about Cyrus's centaurs. But as part of my effort to divert fire from my own argument, let me leave you with two questions. Is the Cyropaidea a book about leadership, or also in some fundamental way, a book about empire? And if it is also about empire, what do Cyrus's centaurs and their antics in the final chapter of the Cyropaidea re reveal about Xenophon's message about the Persian Empire in spe uh, specifically, or about imperialism itself? Okay, that's all I got. You are mute. Sorry, I just forgot. Thank you very, very much, Dave. Uh, and well, now we are going to, sorry. Uh, now we are going to hear the commenters uh, in the following order. Well, we, we don't have a, a Noreen here, but the order will be, is going to be Gabriel first and then Claudia, if that's okay for you. Sure, I'm happy to. I mean, I, I kept everybody waiting for a while, so I'm just wondering if I have any time left. No, no, that's okay. Yeah, how much? I still have time? Okay. Yeah. Uh, um, I prepared some remarks, so they're based more on the article than on what Dave has just said. But I thought what Dave just said changes things a bit, and I would have liked to... Um, be able to say something about what he just said. Um, let me start with what I've already written. Um, I first of all, want to thank Rodrigo for this initiative, which is a wonderful, wonderful idea. And, um, and for the opportunity to read Dave's paper again, which I really think is an excellent paper, written very carefully, and it deserves to be read, read very carefully. It presents a strong and balanced case 
for the idea that Xenophon is critical of Cyrus and his empire. Um, and as I discuss it, I want to mention also some parallels between the Cyropedia as Dave reads it and Plato's Republic. I think these parallels add a little bit to his case also. Um, Dave, as I understand it, Dave argues that the, Cy that the Cyropedia is a cautionary tale, warning the reader against imperial ambition. He argues that Xenophon employs a subtle educational technique, enticing the reader at first to entertain good hopes for Cyrus and his empire, but then subtly undermining these expectations as he goes along. The book thus offers an education to the ambitious reader, leading the potential imperialist to discover the disadvantages of empire. For these reasons, Xenophon offers a generally positive image of Cyrus, even though ultimately the picture is flawed. If correct, this interpretation would show a parallel to the educational strategy used by Plato in the Republic. Socrates indulges Glaucon's and Adimantus' interest in politics by describing an imaginary city at great length, but his real aim is to wean them away from their political ambitions and to turn them to a life of philosophy. While Plato holds out the life of philosophy as an alternative to all of political life, Xenophon, according to Johnson, merely rejects the idea of empire as a good political option. Xenophon's objection to empire can arguably be found also in his criticism of the Spartan Empire, as Dave reminded us. So the claim, so Dave's claim is different, is different from the usual Straussian claim, which says that like Plato, Xenophon denigrates politics as a whole. According to Dave, there's good politics. It's just not the politics of empire. Is that about right, Dave? Okay, good. Um, so what, what are these, what is this good political arrangement? Where is that? <laughs> it's not so easy to find it. Dave suggests that it is to be found in the virtuous city of Persia prior to Cyrus' takeover. The Persians practiced virtue without thinking about rewards or engaging in warfare. This again reminds me of the Republic, in which the first simple city offers an ideal Pacific way of life, arguably superior to that of the inflamed city that occupies most of the book. In both cases, the peaceful, virtuous city becomes corrupted by the desire for wealth, which leads to war. Plato identifies greed as the cause of troubles for human beings. But I'm not sure that Xenophon is equally opposed to greed and the wars it causes. What exactly is wrong with Cyrus and his empire? Dave offers two main criticisms. One, despite his virtues, Cyrus was faulty as a human being. Second, the empire was not good for the people over whom Cyrus ruled, not even the Persians and their allies, and all the more so the subjected people such as the Babylonians. Let me start with the first point. Cyrus is an aloof and seemingly cold or frigid personality. He does everything for the sake of his goal of establishing an empire and does not seem to form close personal relations with the people around him. He cultivates relationships based on charis, reciprocity, rather than philia, friendship. Dave is happy to think that Cyrus at least hoped to marry Panthea, but, but that too ends in tragedy because Cyrus does not really understand people. He relentlessly uses them for his own purposes. We don't hear much about his love life, and in the end he winds up marrying his cousin, not the love but for utilitarian purposes. My response, um, Cyrus was graced with a genuine love of others, philanthropia. He is a charming and warm young man and remains so even in his conversation with his father on the way to battle. He's always respectful to his father. 
He's rather lively in some of the festive scenes, and he is emotional on his deathbed. But it's true, he's, he is aloof and impersonal while serving as commander. What if we compare Xenophon's, if we compare Cyrus to Xenophon's real hero, Socrates? Overall, I think so Cyrus seems more humane <laughs> or more human than Socrates. Socrates advocates a utilitarian approach to almost all human relationships. He advocates ignoring parents unless they happen to be experts in the relevant field. He tells his son to think of his mother as better than a wild animal or to think of her as if she were an actor in a play. And he gives him advice about how to gain benefits from her. Given this utilitarian approach by Socrates, the similarity implies that if Cyrus is flawed, so is Socrates. What about marriage? Love is not necessarily the main attraction in marriage to Xenophon's mind. For Hero, the joy of marriage consists in marrying someone of a higher social status, which unfortunately a tyrant can never do. Socrates, on the other hand, says that he married his wife Xanthippe, not for love or status, but in order to learn how to endure suffering. <laughs> so Cyrus, in marrying his cousin, seems to be well within the norms reflected in Xenophon's other writings. Let's turn to the main substance, however, the polity that Cyrus establishes. Um, Dave argues that the old Persia was good, and that the combination of Persian and Median ways that Cyrus establishes represents a degeneration from the Persian ideal and is also an unstable combination. In reading the article this time, I sensed that Dave presents the transformation of Old Persia as similar to the transformation of the Roman Republic into the <laughs> empire through the emergence of Julius and Augustus Caesar. Like the Romans, the Persians lose their hardy native virtue and compromise their autonomy and equality. They all become servants of one man and are transformed into subhuman creatures. There's some truth in all of that. But I would like to um, raise uh, two points. First of all, the old polity was not perfect either. I have a few examples. They had a law forbidding lying. Now, lying is a good thing, or it can be a good thing. Why did they forbid lying? Because people took advantage of that for selfish purposes. So people were selfish also in the old Persia. Another example, there was no real equality between the classes, something that Cyrus corrects. <laughs> A third example, there was a lack of justice in the old Persia, since virtue ought to receive a reward. But the Persians did not, according to Cyrus, reap the rewards of their virtue. Leo Strauss adds a fourth uh, flaw in old Persia. Why did they agree so quickly to Cyrus' proposal? for imperialism. They must have already been more greedy than they should have been. So this together, this gives the impression that we're not talking about ideal, ideal cities, ideal polities. The second point, without the transformation by Cyrus, the old Persia would most likely have been destroyed by the Assyrians. And this is the point that I wanted to make now, maybe that just occurred to me while Dave was talking, which is that Xenophon is certainly against the Assyrian Empire, but that only shows that some empires are better than others. <sighs> okay, so we could say, okay, Persia was great. It's too bad they had to transform themselves in order to deal with this threat. Um, but I think that for Xenophon, outside pressures such as war 
are positives. They help us. When being under pressure to perform is exactly what makes our virtues shine. This is what Socrates says to Aristippus when he tells him that if he doesn't work hard, he's going to be a slave to somebody else. This is a good thing that there's threat around us because otherwise we would just sit around and do nothing. I would argue that for Xenophon, like Heraclitus and Thucydides, um, the pressures to, 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 uh, for motion, motion is really where we find the true nature of people. We know the famous statements of Heraclitus that um, uh, war is the father of all and the king of all. Some he reveals as gods, others as men. Some he makes slaves and others free. The true nature of people comes out only in conflict. So we should actually be glad that Persia was put under pressure by the Assyrians, which forced this transformation into the more powerful mode of, of uh, existence that Cyrus was able to form. Okay. That's, you know, surely open to debate. How does Cyrus treat his fellow Persians and their allies? This again is a similar to a question that is asked about Plato's Republic. How happy are the soldiers in Plato's Republic? This is a question that Adimantus asks in book five. I would argue that in both cases, the answer is that they are very happy. Cyrus men are lacking in equality and autonomy, but that doesn't bother them very much. For Plato and Xenophon, equality and autonomy, and Dave added um, transparency, are not the most important values. Human beings are herd animals, not isolated individuals. And their success in life, whether in economic and political terms, as in Xenophon, or in philosophical spiritual terms, as in Plato, is more important than their equality and autonomy. There always needs to be a leader. Plato and Xenophon are concerned to provide the best leader possible. I would like to explain why I think Cyrus treat, treats his men well. The book is called The Education of Cyrus. But it concerns not only the education that Cyrus received, but also the education that he provides, chiefly to his men and close companions. He teaches them the same principles that he himself follows, so that they can develop the same leadership skills that he possesses. Like Ischomachus in the Economicus, he wants to have many effective managers to assist him in running the enterprise. He's not tricking them into behaving in ways he would find objectionable. Cyrus works hard for honor, and he wants his followers to work hard for honor. He's willing to delay personal gratification, and he teaches his followers to delay personal gratification. When his Persian soldiers have captured the enemy camp, Cyrus asks them to delay their lunch until the entire army returns from their operations. He tells his men that this is in their own interest because the other members of the army will appreciate the consideration that we are showing and will prefer to have us Persians continue in the leadership position. Again, he's teaching his soldiers the same principles that he follows as leader. He's pulling them up, not pushing them down. My favorite example is the letter he sends to his uncle after taking his uncle's troops in a somewhat questionable way. The letter concludes as follows. Even though I am younger, I advise you not to take back what you give, lest you earn enmity instead of gratitude. When you wish someone to come to you quickly, do not send for him with threats. And when you declare that you are alone, do not deliver threats to large numbers, lest you teach them to think nothing of you. We will try to be back with you as soon as we accomplish what we believe would be good 
for both you and us. Farewell. This may seem like a rude letter, but it is in fact a valuable lesson. Kayaksaris is not behaving rationally. He thinks that because he's king, he can just lay around having a good time and tell people what to do. What Cyrus is trying to teach him is that even a king has to obey the laws of intelligent political behavior. As Heraclitus said, war is the true test of human character. What is offensive in the letter is that Cyrus presents himself as a potential threat to his uncle. The letter reminds me of the words of the Athenians at Milos. They too are honest about the pressures that drive them, including the pressure of their own ambition. But unlike the Athenians at Milos, Cyrus is intent not on doing anything to harm his uncle, but rather to do everything in his power to help him, despite his opposition. I think these and other incidents show how Cyrus seeks to transmit his own values to others, exactly the opposite of what an oppressive leader would do. The regime falls apart. I'm a few minutes over, aren't I? Can I go on or not? A few more minutes? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Five more minutes. Yeah, it's okay. Um, a little bit less. The regime falls apart after Cyrus' death. Dave argues very reasonably that the combination of Persian and Median does not work. The revolution that Cyrus instituted ultimately destroyed his own creation by exacerbating the selfish pursuit of gain. That may be true. I don't think that Cyrus created an ideal constitution. But as Dave also raised this question in his marks today, I'm not sure that the purpose of the book is to describe a perfect constitution. Uh, Leo Strauss wrote that Cyrus did not, in, that Xenophon did not intend to present Cyrus' regime as a model. He rather used Cyrus' meteoric success as the way in which he brought it, and the way in which he brought it about as an example for making intelligible the nature of political things. I would add, including the science of rulership. There may not be any stable constitution. But that doesn't mean that individuals cannot make good lives by learning the art of politics. What about the educational plan? I find it very tempting, as I said, to read it as a parallel to the Republic, but I have a worry. If the book aims at dissuading potential tyrants or empire builders, why does Cyrus turn out to be successful? Would a future tyrant necessarily care about the fact that the empire disintegrated after his death? As, as the man once said, après moi, la déluge. Why didn't Xenophon portray Cyrus as suffering personally for his errors? Moreover, the critique is subtle and would only affect those who noticed it, and among them, only those who found the imperfections worse than the rewards of building an empire. Thank you. Well, thank well, you. Thank you very, very much, Gabriel. And now we can move on to Claudia's comments. That's okay, Claudia. Okay. Thank you. Uh, it's a great, great pleasure to see you all uh, in this way, although I hope we will back soon to our physical face-to-face -face gatherings. Uh, thank you especially to Rodrigo for this interesting idea and for organizing all this known place across very different time zones. Uh, and now let's go to work. Uh, we all love Dave's papers, especially because they allow uh, reacting and saying something like, hey, how can you say that? And this is a strong Socratic future that is, it's very good to keep alive in our times. I will be very brief just to point out two aspects. The first one has to do with the extent of Xenophon analysis. I mean, if what is said about government in the Syropedia is related to the empires or applies to political activity in general, that is the problem of empire versus leadership that Dave mentioned earlier. The parallel with the hero could be useful to assess this issue 
because it explores the ways to change a loosey government into a good one. I am far from the Strussian interpretation that takes Hero's final silence as an indication of Simonetta's failure. On the contrary, I consider that Xenophon bases his scheme in the tradition that tells about Hero's conversion into a good tyrant. Although it does not change the whole story of Syracuse. And uh, in this sense, it is not a final program. We could say that it opens some opportunities, but attached to a strong circumstantial bias, we could say. From this point of view, there are many problems with Cyrus and the Slovakia. Because the uh, measures related to merit are present in both works, and the distribution of goods in the Syropedia has a resemblance in ceremony which advance to the system and awards and rewards. If so, the informations in the Persian concept have a correspondence in Simonides' recommendation for Syracuse. Indeed, they mentions the parallel between the centaurs in the Syropedia and the hubristic horses in Hero 10, which highlights another uh, in another way, the transformation, in this case, of the private mercenaries into some kind of police officers in a kind of modernizing term. Of course, <clears throat> Hero is within the Greek horizon and Simone is guide him with Greek parameters. But in both cases, I believe the Xenophon explores some measures that could work better than the usual scheme for the government. But neither the Syropedia nor the Hero are political programs in themselves. In this sense, they do not need to offer pure characters with definitive ideas, but men in trouble facing the defiant burden of government. Cyrus is doing well, although the end is frustrating and the empire will die with him, while Hero does poorly, although he gets from Simonides some advice that could improve his situation. Is this results unstable, yes, and in both cases. And this seems to be a feature of Xenophon's perspective on political issues in general. I agree with Gabriel a parallel between Plato's Republic, which is in fact also condemned to fall, but it has not the programmatic side of the platonic world. Xenophon has not this idea in mind, uh, because the Syropedia is not an ideal model. Instead, Xenophon invites to study the permanent exercise to keep the ball rolling, and this depends on the skills of some particular individuals. Is this something that happens only in, in buyers? No, I think no. And this description goes beyond the kind of political model and can be found in every political community. In this sense, I believe that the Syropedia follows the same line of other Xenophon's political explorations, which are not primarily interested in positive programs, but in detailed studies of some aspects, most of them psychological or anthropological, that occur in different experiences. None of them is, strictly speaking, a model of their precise for nothing. I think that Dave's uh, idea on the tension around empire could be broadened in something like, remembering the, the end of the paper, those lessons include both how to lead the community and why not lead a community. It implies uh, leadership reading, but that must, it, that's not a pure positive interpretation of the world. Uh, I think the good, bad, bad alternative is not the, the better approach. And uh, secondly, in this same line, I want to mention the last chapter, uh, that it is sad and put us in front of the death of our house to see a clever individual with political phronesis transmitting this knowledge to others. Uh, this is a central topic in Socratic literature in general. Uh, Socrates also fails to educate most of his followers, Alcibiades, Critias, Charmides, but even Aristippus, Aeschines, and especially Plato and his limitations to make friends are cases of dubious characters. Uh, I agree with Dave's critic to Grace's views 
But if this future had really contributes to a positive portrait as Tom says, uh, then there is not a positive portrait of Socrates either. And I prefer to see their reflections on the limits of communication and transmission of knowledge and virtue. In fact, this is a point that concerns especially skinnies, whose fragments show a strong analysis of the intergenerational bonds indicated, indicating in general the impossibility to keep high standards of virtue within a family. Uh, the first generation of Socratics <clears throat> seem to have been very, very far from Aristotle's ideas in the, this short treaty, uh, the Periogeneias, uh, this work where he discussed the good birth and excellence of stock or, or excellence of family and describes the condition of kingship. Uh, again, Cyrus' failure regarding their sons is within the expected and should not be counted as a particular shortcoming. Uh, this is rather a bitter reflection on parenthood, uh, something like uh, those lessons include both how to raise and educate kids and why not to raise and educate kids. Uh, in sum, both the political and the individual level can eventually fail, although we should keep trying. Uh, and this is my contribution to the debate. Thank you very much, Claudia, uh, for your comments. And uh, well, and now we are going to to pass to the next next stage of this workshop or debate. If some of our special guests want to make a remark or a special comment about Dave's paper, uh, or maybe about uh, Gabriel's and Claudia's comment. This is the moment. Any question? Norman, Sean, Sarah? I, I know. I know, something I know. About, oh, go ahead. Okay, okay. I can ask something about centaurs, since that hasn't come up yet, about that image of centaurs. Um, okay, great. I wonder if, and this may be too platonic a perspective, but is the centaur possibly um, a very strong, successful image of reason ruling passion, um, particularly in a society which, although it has been suppressed by Greek religion, is not suppressed in Greek philosophy, a society that lionizes the association of the horse with rule. So it's precisely because the horse has an extremely strong thumos that they make a good image of a warrior, a good symbol of a king, a good object of sacrifice for, let's say, a Vedic king or perhaps for the symbol of, imperial, of Roman power in the, in the case of the October horse ritual. Um, and, but the centaur is um, not lacking in all of that uh, imperial ruler passion, which perhaps is not sustainable, but also adds the virtue of intelligence. So in other words, I'm wondering if um, the centaur image, which is good, uh, is discussed mostly in, uh, in your paper, Dave, as a hybrid, as two things. But I'm wondering if, from a platonic perspective, it isn't important that it's also not just two things, but one thing is on top and the other on the bottom is a good thing for a horse warrior, a military warrior king to have. In which case, um, sustainability is not of great concern, since that seems to be a major critique of the, um, Cyrus's imperialism. You can't sustain it past. Um, but sustainability is not a major concern in the mind of any warrior king. Yeah, I, I very briefly, I mean, I obviously in the paper um, relied on the sort of more, I don't know, general view of centaurs in Greek myth and in, you know, the iconography of the Parthenon and so on. Um, rather than thinking more about uh, platonic parallels, right? You have the, you know, the focus too, obviously, where you have a, a, a portrait of the soul that's horsey. Um, and so, yeah, I, I think uh, you could certainly make an, make a bring those parallels to to, to play and, and try and, and suggest a different um, a different take on the centaurs. I guess the one thing I would say in, in in defense, maybe of going my way rather than going your way with the centaur and the Cyropaidea, is that we we do have that somewhat curious exchange about um, the problems that centaurs have, right? 
that centaurs they can't they can't have it both ways. Um, whereas I, whereas we can because I can get off my horse. Um, and also I have you know four eyes. They only have two. I mean you know so there's a uh, I I I argued then and you know I haven't gone I haven't thought again about centaurs per se in in you know, 15 years. But um, I I argue there that that there is at least a kind of hint that we ought to go in the in the in the direction of seeing centaurs at the Lapith wedding rather than um, thinking of it more positively. But I, I think, uh, you know, if I were, if I were getting that comment as I was drafting the paper, then I would need to think much harder about uh, possible platonic parallels as well. Okay. Any other comment? Uh, I have a comment, Rodrigo, if that's okay. Yeah, of course. <clears throat> All right. Well, uh, first off, thanks uh, for including me in this. And it's really wonderful to see everyone uh, after so long and uh, so many strange twists and turns in the meantime. I was just re reflecting on how most of my interaction with the Xenophon community has been virtual over the years, but it has been no less real. Uh, and so I want to uh, thank Rodrigo and everybody for hosting this. And uh, I want to, I'm trying to formulate my question for Dave as succinctly as I can. Um, and I'm trying to not let my thoughts spin too far out of control, but I'm curious to hear Dave kind of think through um, the, the idea, if, if it's the case that the education of Cyrus is anti-imperial, um, was that message lost on Alexander the Great, who seems to have styled himself uh, as a second Cyrus figure, uh, so much so that we're told that one of his historians uh, him uh, in in the model of Cyrus, and, and and so and what was the message lost on? Alexander was it lost on on Asicritus, and was it lost on anyone in that audience um, who, who would have uh, seen Alexander being model, modeling himself or being modeled as as a Cyrus figure? And I'm one, and and so here's my corollary thought: um, What was the message lost? And if it was lost, is are, would you end up making a similar argument uh, as people who argue that the Aeneid was anti-imperial, even as it was being commissioned by an imperialist, um, seemingly imperialist uh, imperator, uh, Augustus. So that I, I could spin that out further, but I, I'm just curious what your thoughts to, to hear you think through that question, if that makes sense. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I, I think the, uh, the positive reception of the Cyrus idea is, a, is another burden for people who are reading it less positively, right? I mean, um, I, I think going back to a little bit to one of, a point that I think Gabriel made is that, um, yeah, if you're a would-be tyrant and you read the cyberpunk yeah, you're not going to be dissuaded from pursuing tyranny. I don't think, right? I, I think Gabriel's clearly right about that. So, so who is the, on on my view, then who the audience would have to be the you know the kind of the sax sax of the world, right? <laughs> or the uh, or maybe the Cambyses in Persia, I don't know, but it have to be other people who um, have have it at their disposal, you know, not to sign up for the the, the centaur legion um, rather than for would be tyrants, um, because I, I think it's indisputable. I mean, for me, it's indisputable that that the Cyropaidea does give you a lot of lessons that you could apply in in a lot of different contexts, but certainly the most obvious context is 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 uh, uh, imperialism. Um, I think the Aeneid's a good uh, uh, parallel for. Am I coming through clearly? I'm hearing a little bit of fuzz. You, you broke up for a second for me. Okay, yeah, I, I've had a little. You you were breaking up for me too. So who knows? Um, we can fight it out <laughs> as to whose internet is even worse than the others. Um, yeah, the Aeneid is another parallel. Uh, I actually happen to not be of the. Um, Darkness Visible School in the Aeneid. Uh, but um, I think, uh, I mean, the text like the Menexenus might be another funny case too, right? I think the Menexenus is, is a case where I think 
the cons if there is a con there is no consensus about the Menexenus, Plato's Menexenus, it's probably safe to say, but I think there's a, a larger chunk of contemporary readers think that it must be uh, a, a parody. Mm -hmm. um, and yet we're told in antiquity that it was at least, I think mainly, I haven't studied this in great detail, but mainly taken kind of straight up. Um, but so but is, it, is it your sense that the, the anti-imperialist point of the work as you as you're identifying it must have been lost on not only Alexander but his own historian and anyone that he was was propagandizing to maybe in the same way that like for many Americans the anti-patriotic tone of George uh, of um, Bruce Springsteen's Born in the USA <laughs> is lost. I mean, a lot of Americans think Born in the USA, yay, that's that's yeah, awesome, yeah. but. Uh, I mean, is is that what you, you would imagine is going? I, I know this is highly speculative, but it just it, to me it seems like you're talking about a work that a generation later um, seems to have been a template for a pretty massive historical shift. Uh, mm -hmm. and how, how was it that this message was lost on everybody of that generation? Seeming maybe not everybody, but uh, large audiences of that generation. Yeah, yeah. I haven't studied the reception of the of the Cyropedia, right? So, but I. I would say yes. I mean, that's my impression, is that mm -hmm. it, it it was taken. It was there, born in the USA. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> make that the sub sorry. subtitle for your book on the on the cyber next book on the cyber idea to increase sales. Yeah, I but I agree. Yeah, I, I uh, as far as I know, that's how it was. That's how it was taken. We could uh, just throw this out. Where we could look at, you know, the there's a lot of literature that I haven't mastered actually on uh, what Plato says in the laws, right? So you could look at reception there, but um, at any rate. Thank you. Good point. And, and so, sorry, uh, a small follow-up follow -up comment uh, about uh, Normans uh, and including what Gabriel said about Augustus and, uh, and um, about Alexander the Great. Uh, I think the, the both of them, Augustus and Alexander, uh, have the same outcome that the one of Cyrus, you know. Uh, they managed to create a great empire, and only after their death, uh, the empire becomes corrupt, corrupt. And I was thinking about Augustus, and he tried and succeeded to return to the Mos Maiorum, and it was only after Augustus' death that the empire becomes to decline. Uh, and the same goes uh, for Alexander the Great, under Diacodoi. So just just a comment about the same outcomes that we see in uh, after Cyrus' death. Not, not a question, just a, yeah. a, a small remark. Uh, and, uh, and, yeah, and, uh, things fall apart more, rather more quickly for Alexander, right? I mean, Alexander is a is a figure who tries to have romance too, right? It seems uh, it seems to me, and that. So he, there are ways in which he Augustus is a much better Cyrus, I think, than than uh, than Alexander was. Um, but they yeah. they may have learned lessons from the Cyropaidea. But anyway, uh, and another another methodological thing about this this debate, I would love to if you because I, I'm I'm trying to follow um, the the speakers and also the chat, and I think maybe we can ramble all together and try to jump in uh, and speak. At loud, like a face to face meeting, maybe it's uh, like uh, this could be total, totally uh, awful, but maybe we can work it out. Uh, so I, I have read s some great uh, Sean remarks, uh, and maybe if, if, if some of us have some comments, or maybe we want to jump in the middle of the, the questions, maybe we can try to do that. Uh, for the sake of a uh, lively debate, if you are okay, of course, with that. Sean, would you like to add some of the, the, the comments you made in the chat? I just was also noting two things. One is um, back on the Encratia question, the Phaedrus par parallel, actually. Um, could it be that uh, getting off my horse is analogous to incredibly not looking at Panthea. So getting off the horse means dissociating yourself from the excess forceful passion, which you know you've got, which you can use to stamp, stampede people and kill them, but maybe you want to choose not to do that. So that's one thing, I mean, in which case it's um, uh, 
uh, perfectly Aristotelian and Cratic view, it's, but it's also one that allows for the center to not be dangerous and to have successfully been humanized or rationalized. And then on the well, other hand, oh, go ahead, sorry. No, I'm just trying to jump in because Rodrigo told us to interrupt each other. Yeah, yeah. Oh, go. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, when I read the, um, the that, is that the, when he describes the fact that the centaurs, there's something that the centaurs, you know, can't do that we can do because we can get off the horse. And I thought that might be a reference to sexuality. So that the sexuality is not necessarily the horse. What do you mean by sexuality is not necessarily the horse? I mean, when it's only the, the centaurs have a problem because they can't have really relations with a, with a woman because they're they're like on a horse. They're like attached to a horse. But a person can get off the horse and have relations with a woman. Um, so, so, so that so that it's, so that while he's on the horse, he's the political figure. And when he gets off the horse, he's the, you know, more human figure, the more um in you know personal i don't want to say corrupt but just you know indulgent person mm -hmm. to be the opposite of what we think of of you know what we think of the centaur as being the the creature of passion so this may be and, another field. thing about the centaurs is that he calls them hippo kentaur and that's a very rare word usually it's just called kentauroi and I just don't know why he does that, but maybe it's to distinguish them from some concept of of Kentauros that we have already. Yeah. So emphasizing the horsiness, and this may be far afield, but what you just said reminded me actually of um, of that in the Vedic uh, horse sacrifice ritual, which involves at the end of the horse sacrifice where the king uh, strangles a horse to death after not having sex with his wife for a year. Um, the wife lies down next to the dead horse, touches it, and says, man, I am sad because I didn't have sex for a year. So there is something about horses not having sex and about kingship and about sacrifice and warriorship in the Vedic sacrifice, which, again, is not in Greek religion, but which may have some uh, Vestan uh, overtones, which means that it might be an Achaemenid image that may be Xenophon where, or something. About. Where, is that, where is that from? It's in the Vedas, and there's some hints of the Vesta, yeah. So it's an Indo-Europeanist argument, which I am not super expert in. It's kind of iffy, but it, uh, it's similar to what you were saying. Okay. Part, part of it in the immediate context is not having hands, right? I think, right, so that's the a more innocent explanation in, in, in multiple senses. Uh, but that may not be all of it, no, no doubt. Okay. Uh, some, some, some guests have a special guest have a, another question. Uh, I know that uh, Gabriela and Eugenia already make some questions. Maybe I can read it out, out loud or maybe they uh, can read it. I don't know. Do you prefer that I read the questions? Euge, Gabi? Hola, hola, que tal? Mm. Está, está silenciada. You are silenciada. I have okay. some problems with the connection. So if you okay. can read it, it is better. Okay, okay. So I'm going to read a, a question that uh, Gabriela and Eugenio made. Um, and it said, uh, also sirens in general, and Cyrus in particular, are objects of wonder and worthy of, of admiration, we would like to focus on the conceptual relationship between despotism and tyranny, a relationship that since Aristotle has become central to political thought. Does this distinction apply to Cyrus' government? With which regime can it be identified? Or rather, it is an ambiguous, uh, ambiguous political order that presents traits from both tyranny and despotism. Um, I guess I need a little help with 
the distinction between tyranny and despotism. I mean, I, I certainly know Xenophon remarks about the d distinction between tyranny and monarchy, but uh, what what is the? I'm, I'm probably just forgetting something that I, I shouldn't be. But a uh, little help on the the precise di the, the distinction between tyranny and despotism. They quote Aristotle. Yeah. There, there, there's no difference between yeah. despotism yeah. and tyranny. So yeah, I, I, I certainly, I, I did, I, I got this 24 hours ago, but I haven't thought about it, obviously. Um, so I, maybe I'll open up. And certainly, I, I, does anybody else have something to say? <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm, uh, uh, not sure exactly how to read that into or how, how to answer that based on the on the on the chiropedia obviously there can be better and worse tyrants i mean as claudia reminded us about the reformed tyranny of the hero um so maybe that's a, a beginning of an answer but um i'm happy to yield to anyone with a with a real answer rather than just the mere beginnings okay if anyone have some thoughts on that i think i can I think I you're referring to, to the other question. Sorry, I just sorry, had a small point. It's okay. I, I think he refers to despots in one one one. I think there he's referring to despots of private households. Uh -huh. And and Cyrus, uh, somebody refers to Cyrus as despotes. Is it uh, Gabrius later on in Book Seven when he calls him master or lord, something like that? Exactly. Yep. And, uh, and Astiages also is referred as despotes. So would the inference be that Cyrus is domesticating politics? He's making it too much like a household, and so therefore that's a mistake of, of different class? <laughs> no, that's a mistake. him as father. But, but, but that would be a common, a common view on Xenophon work. I mean, in the economical system, it's clear that it's the same to, to, to rule a house, an oikos, than a managed a kingdom. So, so that despotes could be a positive term. Is that what I, you're saying? I, I, I really don't know. I really don't know. I mean, from the Gabrias context and the, the fact that it just means a ruler of a household, really. Yeah. I, I can. Maybe I, I can I can uh, present the other question that they made. Uh, page uh, one eight six states that Cyrus only uses Socratic arguments when it suits him, while the section infantry insists that he is able to change his military or discursive strategies according to the context. We therefore pose the following question. Is his leadership pragmatic and innovative, uh, typical of transi transitional situations? Does Cyrus' ex uh, exceptionality lie in the fact that the characteristic sometimes portrayed as vices of oriental barbarity, hybris, monstrosity, fear, or virtues, moderation, self-control, Coexist in Hume, a Xenophon Greek centered view, suggests uh, page 197. In this sense, Cyrus would resemble a Machiavellian archetype of leadership because he attains a good alchemy of several opposing characteristics. At times, he produces fears and at other times, loves. How do you regard this appreci appreciation? Appreciation, sorry. Yeah, I, I think my point about um, Socratic argument, is, Cyrus's use of the Socratic argumentation is is lifted. I, I hope with attribution from uh, Tatum to some extent, James Tatum's wonderful book on on the Cyropaidea, where he talks about uh, in particularly in particular the um, conversation about uh, uh, what to do about the Armenian king with Cyrus and Tigranes, where Cyrus uh, adopts a, a, a more Socratic line, but, but is perfectly happy to lose the argument. 
um, for, on, I think, for, for pragmatic grounds. Um, so, uh, I mean, there, there are a couple different suggestions in, in the, embedded in the question about how to, you know, how, how, we're, how, to, how we are to react to that, right? I mean, uh, is, is, is Cyrus um, uh, simply being pragmatic and effective in his argumentation, right? Or, or is it, are we to see connotations of barbarism or Machiavellianism or, um, or, or the kind of leadership that's called for in, in transitional times? Um, I, 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 I waffle on this from occasion to occasion, right? And maybe some of the rest of you do as well, but... Um, uh, if we take the, um, I guess the clearest case, which is the trial of the Armenian, um, uh, I, I think uh, his, things work out well for the Armenian king who uh, remains alive, right? And um, uh, I, I think there we get we get so Socratic, of course, that we get the Armenian sophist, right? And I. I I, at any rate, do think that when when Cyrus um, uh, uh, acquits the, uh, the the Armenian king from the sin of having killed the Armenian sophist, that we're we're meant to think that's going a bit too far, and there's something a bit off about that. Um, but I'm not sure I would generalize to the whole to that whole scene and argue that um, there aren't times when you can uh, you can make use of. Um, or you can sort of uh, you can allow yourself to lose an argument. Which is what Cyrus does about the, the fate of the Armenian king, um, even though you have the Socratic weaponry that would allow you to win that argument, because it's it's getting you to a a result that's pragmatically and maybe even compassionately the 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 best one. Uh, I don't know. I, I hope that. Do, do you think that? I think, yeah, I'm just wondering about that argument. Is it? I mean, does is Cyrus just take playing devil's advocate there? I mean, does he really? change his opinion during the argument or is it possible that he always wanted to make friends with the uh with the armenian king but he he had to you know they had to they had to of their own free will make an offer that he would be able to accept so he has to challenge them and he has to say to them listen i can't trust you guys i can't trust you you haven't learned anything whatever you've learned you're going to forget I mean, he has to say that because if they don't have a good offer, he can't accept them. So I don't really see, I don't really see him as losing the argument, even, even, you know, in any sense. Well, he gets what well, he wants. I, I agree with that. I mean, so yeah, I, I, I think in the larger, if you just step back slightly, you, you see that he, that he, that he gets what he wants. And no, I, I think that's a good. I, I, think I mean, that's I was good analysis. That Right. I mean, you have to have a, de a debate. If you want to, anytime you want to explain anything in ancient Greece, you have to have a debate. You have to have a dialogue. You can't just have a, a long lecture about something because that's too boring. <laughs> All right. So you have to have a debate. So you have to have two sides in the debate. And, you know, Cyrus has to take that role because, you know, he's not the one making the offer. That's the way I see it. Um, it's just a literary device for expressing the conditions on which a leader is able to, uh, you know, accept a uh, a untrustworthy repentant. <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't know. Not that helps anything. I I I, I, I it helps me. I and I, I think it it. Um, he's 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 kind of warning them too, right? He's making it clear, I mm -hmm. right that I I understand your arguments, and I I can I can rip your arguments to shreds. Okay, so but but he, I mean, my reading would be, and this is sounds like he's being manipulative, but again, I don't know if that's necessarily a bad thing in this situation. Is that I know your arguments are garbage, and I've demonstrated that now. Mm -hmm. Right, um, but I need but. The best way for me to get an, to uh, increase my power, right, and and help to defend media from these Syrians, is to leave you in charge, and I'm going to do that. But watch out, right? 
Um, mm -hmm. And of course, he also has the garrison between the Armenians and the Calabians, wherever they are next door. Yeah, yeah, yeah. but but the but the, the arrange the, the arrange that Cyrus uh, achieved also works for the Armenians and the Chaldeans. He and Xenophon insist very very strongly on the, uh, on that this agreement actually work out until uh, the present time. You know, so. Mm -hmm. He's being ma manipulative and all, but also this ach this achievement uh, improves greatly the lives of the Armenians and the Chaldeans. Right, right. Yeah, I, I think that's true. I, I guess one of the things we learn from that exchange, though, is that there's no place for Socrates in in Cyrus's world, right? Because because Socrates is presumably not going to. Play that game now. Just as there's no place for Socrates in Plato's Republic in the in the Calipolis, right? Um, perhaps to to allude to Gabriel's, I think, very interesting um, comparison between the Republic and, and the Serapidea. Yeah. Um, but is it good for the Armenians? Is it good for the Calibians? Is it good for Cyrus um, in the world of the Serapidea? Sure, looks like it, right? So. Um, It's a, it, 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 it's, it's, a, it's a typical action of a philanthropist. A philanthropist. Yeah, I mean, I, I he benefit the humanity. I mean, well, he he <laughs> everybody's benefited, right? I mean, I think the uh, one of the I just read um, Tezuka von Berko's wonderful book on economics of friendship, and one of her the points that she keeps coming back to is this, the uh, uh, altruism versus selfishness distinction is is dangerous, right? And anachronistic in some ways. Uh, yeah. So it gave you the point on yeah. a great paper. But not as good as Tezuko's. <laughs> Well, he, he wrote, she wrote an a bo entire book. <laughs> <laughs> Very good one. Yeah. Uh, what about the eunuch issue? We haven't discussed that one. So, so, sorry, maybe maybe we, for the sake of the time, maybe we can enter the open Q&I session. That's okay for you guys? That would be okay. That would should be okay. Would be okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so uh, as I as I said before, uh, I'm going to give the word to some of our students that have been working on comments. Uh, then we can proceed with another questions. I mean, I think we all have a lot of another queries for David uh, or for each other. And also there are maybe there are some questions via YouTube. Uh, and again, so please, everybody feel free to jump into the discussion. Uh, but we have already eight questions set it up. Uh, Julieta Vela, Bautista Bardi, and Francisco Villar, Facundo Bey, Milena Sarno, and Malena Batista, Laura Milman, Matias Muriete, Patricio Fernandez, uh, and I, and Marie-Hélène Trepanier. Uh, so we are starting with uh, Julieta. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Rodrigo. Um, can you all hear me well? Great. Yes. Um, so uh, again, I think we all must thank Rodrigo for this wonderful meeting and this wonderful possibility to chat about Xenophon and Cyrus, of course. Uh, but I'm going to jump in and make my question. So, David, uh, first of all, I must say that I find your paper and your reading of Cyropedia fascinating. I have also read Cyrus quite critically, and I share some of the arguments you presented in your paper. Particularly on page 178, you mentioned one of the premises of your argument, and it has come up before. Um, Cyrus treats his followers like animals and transforms them as well. 
This transformation, and particularly the reference to the centaurs introduced by Chrysanthus 435, is mentioned scarcely throughout the Cyropedia and is considerably in your analysis. I agree that Cyrus transforms his followers, but I find that the transformation of Cyrus's followers doesn't entail necessarily an animalization of any kind, but rather the lack of speech or language. Strictly speaking, centaurs can be thought of as mythic, myth, mythical beasts, sorry, that have the ability to speak rather than as animals. Cyrus's followers could potentially use their linguistic competence due to their human nature, yet they decide not to do so in light of the nature of their bond with Cyrus. For example, in 8 to 12, followers remain silent due to, and I quote, uh, the fear of uttering anything against his, Cyrus's interest. In my eyes, Cyropedia presents Cyrus as a speaker which does not engage in conversation with his followers. He produces soliloquies which are passively accepted by those around him. There is a clear narrative pattern that structures Cyrus's speeches and interactions with his followers. Openings and closings are clearly signed by the narrator. For example, when Cyrus finishes addressing his followers, the text says, and I quote, those, those spoke Cyrus, sorry, or similar phrases. These conclusive phrases not only end Cyrus' speeches and interactions, but also cancel further possible responses by his followers. The ruler followers narrative and discursive structure then turns followers into non-speakers. Cyrus only engages in conversation with characters that are closer to his social status, allies and noblemen. Namely, Chrysanthas in 2357, Cyrus closes Homotimoi, Raulas mentioned as part of Cyrus's oikos, and Goverius, who adopted Cyrus as his son. Yet, these men mostly speak to tell him he's right, and consequently, submitting their voice to Cyrus's. This is the reason that has also led me to believe that the comparison between Cyrus and Socrates, at least from a discursive point of view, is complicated. As Xenophon's Socrates, despite being multifaceted, engages in conversation with his followers where ideas are transmitted and debated, uh, for example, in many passages in the memorabilia. So, my question is, can the transformation of Cyrus's followers be related to language rather than to animals? Yeah, thanks for that. I, 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 um, my, my paper was long, long enough, but I actually had a longer version in which that I originally submitted to the journal and they wisely cut back where I talked a lot about the um, and I haven't gone back and studied that again, again, in the 15 years since I wrote this article, but um, I talked about the, the morose Aglaita Das, right, who was upset about the flattery or the Alatzonea, whatever, however we want to translate that in that scene. I think Gabe really uh, alluded earlier to one of what I find one of the more fascinating remarks in the Cyropedia where, is it Chrysanthus who calls Cyrus frigid? I forget. Yeah. I, I think so. And yes. um, the last time I read the Cyropedia, though, I, I actually, I mean, so much depends on how, how we read the tone of those conversations, I think, right? And I actually was somewhat struck by the, a fair amount of freedom that these people had to, uh, to push him a little bit. Um, so they, they pushed him a little bit, and then you get this kind of laughter. Um, and a lot depends on the, is the laughter jolly? Oh, right. The old Cyrus, right. Or is it the kind of laughter that's used to, um, nervous laughter that, that is used in order to, to kind of cover over, uh, tensions. And I, 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 and the second kind of laughter I think would be in keeping with Julieta with your, uh, concern about the, um, silencing impact perhaps that 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 cyrus cyrus has but for what it's worth at, at least the last I, I haven't studied this and I, i'm eager to hear what others have to say but um last time through i mean if you read it uh cynically enough to find tension as i do then you have to grant well he allowed for a certain amount of tension yeah uh -huh. right he allowed people to kind of say Right, 
Um, and so it it, it kind of it can kind of it can kind of flip. But then we get this this kind of so they mix laughter with seriousness or these kind of remarks where it, it, it seems to just kind of go away the, the tension. At any rate, so I see some degree of um, uh, posturing and 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 uh, critique of of Cyrus and some of those exchanges. Um, then covered over by laughter. So whether you want to play that up and give that kind of a darker or a lighter reading is is to some extent in the eye of the beholder, maybe. I don't know. But thanks. It's a good question. Thank you. Um, yes, I believe that um, you're right about the that this could change if we read those um, perhaps exchanges with different tones. But I think that the narrative is planned out in a way that um, we just can read those laughs. We don't have anything else um, for us to read in those exchanges. Uh, so we're left with trying to judge different tones. Uh, but And I think that uh, my reading uh, goes to the point that there is nothing more else to compare that and that's why um i was thinking about this idea of non-speakers norman would, would would you like to to say that out loud it's very interesting what you oh, just I, I just meant what one one possible bit of contrast within the cyropedia uh, is what what Cyrus critique the the behavior at the um, the drinking parties of Astyages uh, when, when he's critiquing uh, Astyages and his friends for drinking too much and that seems to be a completely uh, lawless kind of experience where Cyrus says you know you, you all they all forget that uh, you're the king or you forget that you're the king or something like that. Whereas what Cyrus does seems to have a much more uh, structured and educational, um, well, there's an educational structure to it or a um, edificational structure to it where yes, he, he's still in charge, but he does allow uh, some light mockery here and there, but, but not so far that people forget who's in charge. Yeah, yeah. definitely. I think that there are no instances where, uh, someone challenges uh, Cyrus's words in any way. They cannot say, I don't agree, though it's, you're totally right that they mock him to a certain extent in that passage, but because they're in a different uh, scenario, of course. Um, but yeah. Okay, let's proceed with uh, Bautista and Francisco question. If that's okay. Okay, perfect. Well, hello, David. Uh, thank you very much for being here. And of course, thank you, Rodri, for organizing everything. Well, uh, I originally planned a question related with imperialism in the constitution of the Lacedaemonians and the Poroi, but since you have already addressed it in your presentation, I have another one more related with Xenophon's military reforms. Uh, well, the radical, I remember that the radical decision taken by Cyrus of arming the commoners with the heavy weaponry of the peers is described in your paper as a shift you know, from this egalitarian ethos to a meritocratic one, and while well, leading to this fundamental transformation of the Persian community. I just wanted to know if for you this logic is only present in this passage or uh, do you believe that this egalitarian meritocratic dynamic is also present in other works of Xenophon? I, I, I send you the, that, that passage that for me, it can be, uh, this can be happening, which is the, the, the military reform uh, that Xenophon uh, suggests implementing in the Poroi, where he, well, he suggests that metics should be prevented from forming part of the hoplites, restricting membership only to citizens, but at the same time, allowing them to form part of the cavalry, which was a unit traditionally related with the aristocracy. And well, for me, uh, I just wanted to know if in this precise example, uh, do you see here like a, a similar movement, but from uh, but going from meritocracy back to egalitarianism regarding the hoplites, while at the same time consisting in a fundamental transformation of the Athenian community? 
Well, that, that, uh, that is my that is my question. Yeah, thanks. And I, I, um, I, uh, I, we're getting reverb somehow. But at any rate, I yeah. think that um, maybe Juan's speaker. Please try to mute your microphone. Let's see. You, maybe that'll do it. Okay, if good. You don't have uh, a headset. Um. Uh, I, I think it was a case of great minds thinking alike that I was already thinking about imperialism versus leadership. Okay, but your question certainly strengthened me, and uh, so I was thinking of it as I as I finished drafting my remarks about what I was going to say today. So, um, uh, I and I, I do think that the the meritocracy egalitarianism kind of dynamic is. I mean, it's certainly present in a lot of ways in the Syropideia, Just to, to limit it to that, since that's where. Uh, all I've got room in my head for right now, in terms of the um, Cyrus worked both to give everybody access to the same food and the same sunusia, the same companionship. You know, it's kind of a big tent, right? But then he also gives awards to rewards to people who are particularly, you know, meritorious. So he's it's an, yet another way in which he's trying to have it both ways, right? He's trying both to um, make the society much more equal by bringing everybody else up to the same weaponry and the same status in some ways as, as the as the peers once had, but also rewarding individuals. So that that I, I think goes goes throughout the uh, uh, the Cyberpunk day and is another example of the attempt to merge things. Um, I'm not sure I have anything of great value to say about the Boroy passage. I did look at it quickly. Um, I it it's. Uh, I mean, he he's trying to do medics a favor by, uh, I, I think, right, by um, saying they don't have to fight as hoplites, but they get to fight as cavalry. Um, and so what that says, you know, why it's a favor to, to, to get to, to be in the cavalry and why it's a burden to have to serve as a hoplite, um, I think it's going to say, tell us, we'd have to think a lot more about the specifics of the Athenian situation, I, I think, to get to get at that. Um, uh, I, I, I looked briefly at, uh, David Whitehead's, uh, I happened to have it on my bookshelf, his commentary in the Poroi, and he suggests that they're, Xenophon's talking about different classes of hoplites, right? And that sort of middle class, uh, sorry, different classes of medics and that middle class medics found it a burden to serve as hoplites because they had businesses to run. I'm using somewhat anachronistic terminology here. Um, whereas the best off among the medics were deprived from the opportunity to serve in the ca cavalry. Um, so different medics had different kinds of aspirations. Um, I'm not really sure exactly how to how to translate that into the meritocracy egalitarian uh, framework, but I agree that it's a passage I overlooked when thinking about uh, Xenophon on cavalry and. Um, and it is a military innovation that I think, uh, again, in the uh, version 2.0 of this article, should anything like that ever appear, it would be a passage to, to, to take account of. Okay, Francisco? Hey, David, I, I have some reservations about whether from your interpretation of Syropedia, it can be drawn uh, a broad disapproval against, against imperialism. I think you identify the limits of the empire of Cyrus in very specific decisions made by him on the basis on the human, cultural, and material grounds he had available. And I think your emphasis on the unstable of the Persian Median hybrid should limit your conclusions to that case. Uh, the assimilation of Persians and territories is very easy to for a, by a sharp reader, that is right, but that of Persians and Greeks is not so, uh, in my opinion. And I can't avoid thinking, indeed, that the, regarding the negative picture of current Persians, the final chapter of Syropedia is very close to Isocrates uh, Panegyricus, and Syropedia could be a tale of the birth of nowadays uh, weak Persians, and why not an invitation to, to conquer them? And following your interpretation, maybe an empire made up of Greek elements, less diverse and unstable, might not have the same problems as and the monstrous construction to, to Cyrus, of Cyrus. 
just a few challenging claims. They are related, I think, to the comment of Norman. I think that the anti-imperialist message of Europedia is not quite clear, and it could be the, the opposite. And what do you think about it? No, I, that's a that's a, a great point about, um, I mean, I, uh, I, I think the point you're raising is whether there's something, whether this hybridity thing that I uh, emphasize is inherent to imperialism. Um, I guess I'd, I'd be willing to argue that it is. Uh, <laughs> I haven't thought it, I hadn't be, uh, thought as clearly as you have about that particular question. But it, I mean, if we define what an empire is, an empire is is rule of one people over a different people, right? And so your options there are either to just completely oppress and uh, enslave the conquered people, and there are, I think, issues with that imperialistic model, or to try to do something like Cyrus does, or something that Alexander tried to do, of course, right? When he did conquer the Persians, Alexander, the, the, all the marriages and right taking on some of the trappings of the the Persian imperial rule, um, and and that's going to end you. That's going to put you into the kind of hybrid land, um, which also has its its um, its challenges. I mean, it seems to me to be a, be a more promising uh, approach than just to enslave the people you conquer. Um, but you know, maybe that's me. Right, uh, and maybe uh, if you look at some, you know, kind of more hardcore pan, pan, uh, pan Hellenic uh, idea about what to do to the Persians, um, you know, you 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 might, you know, I, I, it's conceivable that, you know, there there were people in uh, Xenophon's circle, Xenophon himself, I don't know who would who would embrace that 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 model of imperialism and not embrace the hybrid model um, for reasons like those I, I found in the Cyropaidea. And obviously there were people in Alexander's circle, the Macedonian old guard, and I'm not an Alexander expert, by the way, to make it clear, but they were that his moves to were controversial, right? Uh, I think we all know in his efforts to try to do, whether it was motivated by something higher or simply pragmatic, this kind of similar argument we have with Cyrus, but his, his efforts to sort of meld together Greek, Macedonian, and Persian, ways were were not always received well by the Greeks and Macedonians. Um, I don't know if that helps, but I uh, your, your, I don't know if my answer helped, but your your uh, your question help certainly helps me think more about the dynamics of empire and how how universally applicable the lessons of the Cyropaidea are. Yeah, I think that there, uh, it would be a problem for ruling in Asia without the problem uh, similar to, to Cyrus, I think. Uh, you have a point of, with, with that. Uh, that's okay. Thanks. Okay, let's move on with Facundo's question. Hi, everyone. Do you hear me? Yes. Yep. <clears throat> So hi everyone. Uh, first of all, I would like obviously to to thank Professor Johnson, all the amazing discussions we had today, and, and Rodrigo, and the University of Buenos Aires for this excellent organization. Well, so although I agree with uh, Professor Johnson's point of view on Xenophon's criticism of Persian imperial imperial expansion and its instability as a political unit. What I would like to suggest is that uh, Xenophon through Cyropedia may be criticizing, especially Cyrus' unawareness of the political consequences of introducing technological changes in his army, as well as the ethical transformations necessary to expand the territory of Persian Empire in an unprecedented way. And in this sense, I think that uh, it is extremely hard to split Xenophon's account of Cyrus' leadership of his criticism of imperial expansionism. I have three short questions. My first question, my first question addresses especially the subject of leadership, while the last two questions are rather related to how Cyrus, Cyrus leadership and empire may be bonded. So uh, first, would you agree, Professor Johnson, with the idea that 
presentas resorting to the partial, temporal, and occasional transformation of the army into the mythical image of centers demands a decision on when and why to become what I would call pseudo centers, not less uh, than I, I will clear myself about this, not less as practical cases of war that cannot be tied to a fixed nature or norm, but rather to an exceptional political and military situation and criterion. And that these last two elements can only increase Cyrus' power as well as unavoidably to shape his empire. If so, do you think that it is, uh, that is it really possible to determine sharply which may be a suitable or warlike situation for this huge conversion when referring not to civil society, but an army at war, taking into account that war is not an accidental event for warriors, but their only way of life? A short note, I, I call civil centers an army that would have a horseman superior and more exceptional even that actual mythical centers by means of a technological conversion that it then intends to be limited and occasional in order to avoid the permanence the permanency of monstrosity among the the persian soldiers and that clearly fails as it makes permanent a new atos that hardly may be called sovereign but loyal and greedy uh secondly uh and this is my second question so would you agree that the ethical transformations on the Omotimo are as important as the technological innovation introduced by breeding occasional centaurs and that those changes seem to have had permanent consequences for the Persian army as well as Cyrus' devotion to war and expansion may have had consequences on the education of the non-warrior Persians as commented in Plato's laws? And last, would you agree that Cyrus' exceptionalism may be seen not only as a successful rule performance over his subjects, but as an experiment aimed to achieve for himself a superhuman determination that we may call uh, a will of centrism that uh, Xenophon criticizes not in psychological terms, but as the impossibility of achieving political stability from a long-standing point of view? Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> yeah, a lot of um, wonderful stuff in that in that question. And uh, just to start with the, that technology, um, I, I there are a, there's sort of a, a minor key of technological determinism in the text, right? This this notion that um, uh, I, I'm thinking of the of the passage about cavalry later on, where he arms them with a single palta, I think it is, so a single spear, and so they're forced to uh, charge, right? Because if they don't charge, they're not any good. They don't have, a, you know, they don't. As Xenophon recommends elsewhere, have two spears so they can throw one and at least do something and still have a weapon, right? So if you've only got one weapon, um, all you can do is charge. And similarly for the um, for the Persian, uh, the commoners who are armed as infantry early on, right? You no longer have missile weapons. So if you've been eating, if we've been feeding you for all these months, right? Um, if you're going to be worth a damn in the battle, you have to go and you have to fight hand to hand. Um, so I, I think you're really onto something with Xenophon certainly has showing some interest in these technological um, changes. And, um, you know, what he seems to be arguing, and this is something I've thought about on a paper I'm working on for Gabriel, is um, he seems to be implying that you can make people bold or, if not courageous, just by changing their weapons, right? If you have a, a bow, you don't have to be courageous. But if all you have is a sword, right, you have to be, you're going to be courageous then, right? So there's a te technology seems to be driving uh, changes in character and ethics to get to the last of your of your three little questions there in a way that um i guess my take would be that uh it's unsuccessful ultimately right because when we get into 8-8 eight, eight, uh we're we're told that they no longer right they're armed the same way but they don't fight the same way right so xenophon so cyrus's effort to switch the technology and have that determined character 
ultimately fails. Um, let me see if there's anything else useful I can say in response to your, I mean, the, I think a couple of people, and forgive me for forgetting who raised it earlier, but the, there was the, the sense of ex an exceptional situation. I mean, Gabriel said something along these lines, um, uh, you know, we're under attack, right? And there's, and we, we have to, or, you know, Persia is next after media, right? I think it's fair to assume that. And so we have to, under these exceptional ch circumstances, we have to change the way we fight. Um, but I don't think there's any sense in um, the Sauropidea that any of that's going to be temporary, right? I don't think there's any going back. I mean, old-timey Persia, which I've idealized perhaps a bit naively, is kind of left back there as kind of a it's kind of like Sparta in the Hellenistic period, right? This little kind of like Disneyland version of, I mean, that's, that's going a bit too far, but it's, yeah, it's still there. But in, and I, I, once in a while I go visit and we remember the old days, but it, you know, um, but the transformation is meant to be uh, permanent. Um, so it's not simply a, we have to sacrifice and not do things the old Persian way right now while we fight off the Assyrians. No, right? We preemptively go against the Assyrians, right? And then we keep going. <laughs> um, and Xenophon, I, I'm thinking a little bit of the distinction between a, a, a conquest empire and a tributary empire, which some scholars of empire make, right? And again, that's another case where he maybe is trying to have it both ways, even if he hadn't thought through in quite those exact terms, because um, Cyrus seems to be putting his empire on a at any rate, maybe he doesn't make that transition from a conquest empire to a tributary empire. Um, but I should shut up. I've said too much already. But uh, thanks for the the question that really keys us in on a I think of a fascinating aspect of the uh, of the text. Thank you very much. Okay, let's go with uh, Lena and Malena. Okay. Hi, Dave. And Hi. Um, thank you for your wonderful paper. Uh, we, want, we want to, with uh, Malena, I'm Milena and she's Malena, <laughs> <laughs> to comment on your, uh, the section Romans, where you address uh, Cyrus' virtue. Uh, I, in, par in particular, want to ask you about the relation you made between Socrates and Cyrus' virtue. Um, because I agree, I want to make it short, I'm sorry, I agree that maybe Cyrus does not measure up with Socrates in his continence, right? Because he wants, he prefers to avoid pleasures, right? Uh, but, well, as you say, this is a valid strategy for Xenophon, right? In Memorabilia 138, uh, for Socrates, Xenophon. Um, I mean, Maybe he does not measure up, but this not necessarily make him incontinent or vicious. I mean, uh, not to put Cyrus on a pair with Socrates in terms of his moderation is not necessarily a criticism of Cyrus, but maybe an appraisal of the figure of Socrates, right? Which I thought he, uh, he thought as an ideal of virtue. And uh, on, on the other hand, uh, I'm not sure if it's fair to compare uh, these two characters, but the same yardstick, yardstick because um, they have, they don't have the same profession, right? They don't have, they don't play the same role in society. I mean, Socrates is a philosopher and a teacher of ethics and politics, and he has no direct political interest, interest right? Like uh, someone said before. And his function is to be an example of virtue in order to educate others in this in this matter. But Cyrus is a politician, strategist, and he, this position does not imply as exactly the same virtues or maybe the same application of the virtues, right? Um, I mean, immersed in the political arena, I think um, Cyrus' use of Socratic arguments for a practical purpose may not be a vice, but a virtue, right? And even uh, Xenophon Socrates himself is a strong advocate of uh, utility and profit, as, as Gabriel mentioned uh, before. So I don't see that necessarily as a problem. Uh, so 
my question is that, no? It's, it's fair to compare, say, Eros virtue with that of Socrates. And then uh, Male has uh, another question in relation to this. Hi, everyone. I have a little comment about the problem of the human in Cyrus. Um, in your paper, you affirm that the possible hope of a romance shows the humanization of Cyrus as it reveals the existence of other desires besides power. In contrast to this assertion, I believe that the desire for power, as well as the desire for women and lovers, is authentically human. So I don't believe that Cyrus' humanity will manifest itself only in his final instances. I believe that the same desire to build an empire and put everything under one's own control is clearly human. Cyrus is a figure completely immersed in ambition, and there is nothing more human than that. Such ambition can be considered as one of the virtues that drives a ruler like Cyrus to try to achieve an inspiration of such magnitude or not. In addition, the behavior and measure path he chooses to take with respect to everyday life only reflects a political strategy and at the same time reflects the considerable self-knowledge that Cyrus possesses of himself as he confesses to his friend Araspas in Cyclopedia Book 6, Chapter 1. Uh, so, could we say that humanity manifests itself only when it comes to the erotic? Thank you. <laughs> Uh, yeah, thank you both. Um, I think uh, Milena uh, raises uh, one of, I think, the, the largest questions for Xenophon, right? Which is, what are we to do with these two figures of Cyrus and Socrates, right? Um, how are we to rank them? Are we to compare them? Um, I, I guess the, in, in short compass, I think the, the sanest thing I can think of to say um, is that there, there are places in the Cyropaideo where Socrates is evoked in some way, right? I mean, the Armenian Sophist, the, the arguments about the trial of Tigranes that we talked about uh, a few minutes ago. Um, I think the decision, Cyrus's unwillingness to go visit Panthea, right, while her husband is still alive, I think a lot of us, the parallel with Theodote is, seems to be striking enough that we're, so there are at least moments where we're supposed to, I think, compare the two figures. Um, but, uh, you know, there's, I, I think your, your, the cautionary, um, uh, message in your question is also sensible, right? Is that Cyrus has a different task set in front of him than Socrates does. And, um, there may be, you know, very important differences between someone who's very happy to, to, to hand out leadership lessons, which Socrates is, um, but who, who decided not to lead himself in, in the most obvious senses at any rate. Um, quickly to talk about, about the humanity of Cyrus. Yeah, I, I used um, human in a uh, curious of common sense, right? To think of romance as being you know, more human than uh, the will to power. Um, I, uh, I guess I not, and I, I may just be missing something, but at the beginning of the Cyropedia, Xenophon says that ruling human beings is really hard. Um, but he doesn't. I, I I'm, I'm not remembering him saying that, but everybody wants to do it, right? Um, uh, I mean, I think that's a common perception, and we see, you know, attract, attractions in it. Um, and, and we certainly see a lot of characters in Xenophon who have this who have this view, um, but I I think part of the uniqueness of his Cyrus is his is his ambition. He's philo Timotatas as well as all the other philo things, right? Ph philanthropic and philo mathes. But I'm I'm mangling the Greek. Very right? fond of learning, fond of honor, fond of uh, humanity, right? And so. Um, whether we call that human or not, I don't know, but it, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's, it's a, 
Cyrus is certainly more interested in in ruling, perhaps in a, a very positive sense than than most humans are. But I'm going to be quiet so I give other people a chance to to respond because there's been so much. The, these questions have been very rich, and I can't I can't do them justice by myself. Okay, somebody wants to say something, or maybe we can move on to the next question. Yes, I just want to say that uh, I agree that uh, there's a lot of Socratic like passages and things in the Cyropedia. Maybe, I don't know, but we can consider Cyrus like a good application of the, these Socratic principles. We have to see that it's not the same, like they, they fulfill different roles, but uh, with a, a common ground, I don't know. If I can just comment on that briefly, um, I think that the main difference is, as you say, is the difference in their in their behavior. You know, yeah. Socrates and Socrates in their person in, in their who they are. Socrates is ugly, and Cyrus is beautiful. So, Cyrus was born to a a kingly family. We don't hear anything about Socrates' background, and Socrates just doesn't get involved in in you know ruling in, in a political way, but. But Xenophon seems to make every effort possible to bring Socrates as close as he can to the model of Cyrus in the sense of he doesn't deny that he teaches politics when Antiphon attacks him. And in fact, he says he does politics, which is strange because, you know, Antiphon asks him, how can you teach politics if you don't do politics? And then Socrates says, but I do politics because I teach politics. So yeah. Yeah. he's trying to make Socrates as political as he can. I mean, he's got a terrible material to work with, but he does he does get somewhere with it. So, you know, I mean, Xenophon Socrates is political in some way, and you just have to figure out exactly how to explain that. And let's let's not forget about the memorabilia for one two, where it said that so the the main virtue of Socrates was to detect the nature of the humans that that can contribute to improve the better life of the society. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. That yeah. is politics. Absolutely. Uh, well. Then uh, I'm going to give the word to Laura, Mil Laura Milmon, which is our Argentinian lost in Calgary. Well, hi everyone. Thanks for for this meeting. Thank you to Rodrigo and Dave, especially. My question, as I as I thought it, thought of it uh is on the intro part of partly on the introduction of the text and how uh dave states and i agree of course that uh Thomas side does not need to be a positive uh have positive connotations and i agree with that but i i think that or my question has to do on whether we should uh, instead of trying to choose one um, one meaning, if we should not try to exploit this ambiguity, although part part of my question was related to leadership, and that has already been addressed. That was not uh, what you were talking about, and how Xenophon read those aspects of leadership. I cannot feel, but. I cannot help but feel that even though Xenophon is critical both of imperialism and of Cyrus as a human being, a little on the lines of what Claudia was saying, that it's uh, not a programmatic um, project necessarily, but something more uh, preliminary, or as I see it, because of this, uh, use of Thaumatsu style pre precisely, uh, it's a problematic uh, work in which if 
and here comes my question, and I'll let you talk. If we actually exploit that polysemy of the verb, a possibility we have in Greek, but it's a little more difficult to uh, to actually satisfy in English or Spanish, maybe we we find, uh, I don't want to say new, more nuances, but maybe we shouldn't have to decide on whether there is a totally positive or a totally negative view, and rather try to see those in-betweens that might make a, of a more interesting reading. And maybe if it's somehow possible, try to make us aware of our own biases as researchers. I don't know if that makes any sense, but that's where I was pointing. Yeah, thanks. Um, I mean, I think you're in, in some ways getting at, uh, I mean, there, there are at least three options for how we take this, the, the Sauropidea, right? It, it is we, there's a dark reading, and there's a light reading, and then there's the uh, gray reading, right? Um, where it's a uh, Cyrus is good to think with kind of reading, right? Where he raises all these questions in a, where his exceptionality makes him a, uh, an example that's good to think with rather than a model to follow. Yeah. And um, uh, and Thomas, that side, right? The wonder at the beginning can has is is indeed uh, multifaceted and can can reply to all sorts of different kinds of objects and observations. Uh, I'm you know I'm, I'm tempted to to declare victory if I can pull enough people into the gray zone. Okay, <laughs> on the on the Sarpidea. I would be more than happy to stay there. <laughs> However, but that's I, why I find why I find it so full of, of different approaches we can take. Because yeah, you know. and I, I guess I, 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 I'm also, however, tempted to mention an article that a, a humanist friend of, of mine sent to me. Um, I probably deserved it. I can't remember when it was, but it's a, it's an article that's gotten a lot of, it's a few years old now, but it got a, a great deal of um, attention in sociology. And um, the article's title is, and I'm, I'm quoting uh, literally the title, the title of the article is Fuck Nuance. I have it to read here. <laughs> yes, okay. So um, I, I think it's, it's uh, it, it is important to try to, um, get beyond the good to think with, I mean, granting that, right? But to try, and so I guess the ways that I've tried to split the difference in ways that aren't simply kind of um, on the one hand, on the other hand, um, is, is to say that, to, to go to circle back to my opening remarks, is to think about leadership versus imperialism. And to say that, yeah, the Cyberpidea, uh, it's it's not gray, it, it's not, not that it's gray, is if you look at it more closely, you'll see that some of the pixels are black and some of the pixels are white, okay? And the white ones have to do with leadership and the black ones have to do with the empire, all right? So I, I think that uh, That's nice. is a way of getting us beyond the, um, uh, av avoiding the attack from that sociological art article of, of just being, you know, here's <laughs> another factor. And you, you can look at it this way, you can look at it that way. Well. Good. That's a start, but it's not. It's not a satisfactory uh, reading of the text. Um, at any rate, that's what that's that's what I can think of in response. Uh, at least, if I, at least I got an f bomb in to the conversation today, so I can declare victory <laughs> on those terms as well. Thank you, Sean. Would you like to say that out loud? Uh, I can maybe. Um, so this is. I, I wonder if um, on the question of the different measures that uh, it's fair to measure Socrates and Cyrus, if we can combine that with the question of uh, the hybrid imperialism matter and the um, even the center image. Um, because, so this is a different, this is a little bit of a rambling question, um, but my thought is that um, we might be able to get at a big difference between the Platonic and Xenophontic Socrates on the one hand, and also address the problem of royal succession after the exceptional king's death in a way that brings together a Straussian secret rejection of immortality also um, gets the erotics of philosophy and empire together. 
um, by thinking that it seems to me that Xenophon's um, Cyrus and his Socrates are both people whose lives go to a place that is obviously admirable and worthy of following and all of that. But Plato Socrates is someone you might want to follow beyond death into some other place. And in the case of the Xenophonic Socrates, I think it actually is not so clear. He seems to be somewhere in between. But to me, therefore, I'm seeing the, the continuum to be like Xenophon Cyrus, fully affirmative of the world after he lives, if dies, whatever. Xenophon Socrates is concerned with um, a little bit more, not the Platonic ideas, perhaps, but a little bit more than just the affirmative way or the political way. And then a um, Platonic Socrates, on the other hand, who's at least eventually um, in, in the later dialogues, maybe more concerned with something that has nothing to do with this space. Now, that may be wrong, but that's one reading of Plato with this complex of both ending your life and also judging these two characters together. Great. Thanks, Sean. Yeah, I, let me, I just agree, right? Uh, so you get some response. I think that spectrum makes a lot of sense, right? Plato, Socrates, Socrates, uh, Xenophon, Socrates, uh, and Cyrus. I mean, if, if you can think of them along, being along a spectrum. It's in keeping with what Gabriel said about Xenophon perhaps shoving Socrates as far as he can towards Cyrus. Um, yeah. Except well, in that one remark where, that one remark where Socrates says he... Um, you know, needing nothing is divine. You know, Cyrus is not a person who needs nothing. He's a person who wants a lot. And so that one's really, I, I don't know how to deal with that one very well, because that one really pushes Socrates into the direction of Plato, which I, uh, I find, um, you know, because Socrates, Xenophon Socrates is so hates, you know, mathematics and anything on impractical so how could he be uh how could he have any regard for plato socrates at all it depends on how much eros has to do with or derives from need i think there is some even a platonic eros an early lower level of eros comes from a lack or a need but the higher level does not but it's still a ladder even if plato so, sorry i i, I cannot uh, miss greg uh negating with her head. Do you want to add something? It would be awesome. Uh, I, I guess I could just think of a few places where Socrates and Xenophon is actually presented as being very much like the Socrates and Plato, but it's very muted, I admit. So in the symposium, just to take one simple example, after he admits he just had a little too much to drink, he admits also that he reflects on the nature of um, fuel and water, that despite the fact that both are wet, one burns and one doesn't. So I think mm -hmm. there are, are several passages like that in Xenophon where he lets the mask slip. <laughs> Thanks. I, I'd like to disagree with Gabriel about this to some extent, too. I, I'm more of a glumper than a splitter with the Socrateses. But I mean, I, but the lumping takes some work. I think I would, I would agree. All right, so I'll, I'll make a nuanced comment there. Yeah, I take the easy path. <laughs> <laughs> well then uh, Matthias Muriete I, I don't know if Matthias is logged in can you oh, hear well. me yeah. hi hello bye Rowena by, by the way yep Great. Uh, well, um, such such a uh, so uh, David, my um, the main of my context to the. Uh, imperialistic um, campaign of Cyrus and I'm not, not um, um, because my uh, not a, um, the context that I that I find in the, in the campaign that uh, we, you you guys have mentioned it uh, in this meeting is that thing of uh, 
Es que... Of the the threats that were uh, yeah uh, I'm still yep it is kind of difficult to hear Hello. you but yeah am I still I hear you. Um, so in this context, we have the uh, can't hear you. Maybe you can share your screen, your question. Yeah. If you can, if you can, if you can, if you can send to me, I can yes. read it out loud. Okay. Uh, will it help if I? Okay. If you send me your question, I can okay. read it out loud, uh, and maybe we can and give the word to Patricia Perez Fernandez. Patricio? Everyone, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. I'm having that kind of problem with connection too, so this can this might be something difficult, but let me see if I can turn on the camera. Okay. Well, thanks Rodrigo and thanks David for this opportunity. I want to say that Rodrigo and I work together in this question. So, Rodri, if you have something to say, please go ahead. David, on page 178, you say that Cyrus subjects willingly obey, obey him. They do so largely out of fear. However, it is hard for us to understand how Cyrus' government can be based on fear if, as you say, on page 177, he was able to inspire such desire to favor him that all deem him worthy to govern. The point is that we don't see a very clear relationship between fear and desire. Furthermore, in different passages where it's discussed how to govern, as Cyropedia mm, 113, line 9, Cyropedia 114, etc., go, uh, sorry, fear not appear as a central element. So, we would like to ask you how to understand the role that Xenophon gives to fear in government. Thank you. Let me make sure, am I, am I on? I've forgotten. Yes. Um, yeah, I, I think you guys are absolutely right that um, fear is not a dominant uh, feature of Cyrus's government, okay? And um, that, that line you found in my paper I, I think is is uh should probably be stricken from the record really um it's uh i i think that um uh i mean what i argue after all is that cyrus transforms the you know the peers into centaurs and um he doesn't he, he doesn't do that directly out of fear. I, um, I mean, there is some fear of the Assyrians, but I don't think there's really uh, fear of um, uh, Cyrus per se at that at that at that stage. As Gabriel pointed out a moment ago, right? Gabriel quoting Strauss, right? One of my favorite things in the world, um, <laughs> uh, saying that they they immediately volunteer right to to become cavalry right and that and they, they and they they're they're complicit in their own corruption and that shows us something uh rotten in the state of old persia um uh you know there there's there's that passage um 115 i guess is what i was thinking of where we where, where we're, we're told about the spread of fear um 
I think fear is where there is fear. It's it's in the part of Cyrus's empire that we see very little of, right? Which is the which is not the elite in the court. Um, I mean, there's we, we we can find fear there if we look for it, but it's in all the people who are um, in his subjects. I, I would I would I would think, right? I mean, the the justification for the ongoing regimen that the Persian elite is supposed to maintain and then fails to maintain, but it's supposed to maintain is is the need to uh, stay tough and be ready to fight, right? Because um, the 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 subject states are 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 likely to want to try to, um, to try to revolt. Um, but I so I uh, to be more concise finally i think I, I agree that um fear is not as much of a uh, uh it's not a dominant theme in the in the cyropidea but i also don't think it's a it, it's a terribly important building block in my argument either if that makes sense yeah yeah yeah, yeah. I, I agree that that your your, your argument doesn't Fall apart, uh, <laughs> but uh, I, I I was really shocked about this uh, b because it was in the in your introduction, right? Uh, Cyrus subjects obey him largely out of fear, uh, and I know I I send you a, a big comment full mm -hmm. of quotes. <laughs> Sorry for that. No, that's fine. Uh, no. Trying to 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 address my point. Uh, but yeah, yeah, I completely, completely agree that that your argument uh, is sound without without that. But I only want to stress. Uh, I, I'm sorry that Norman isn't here because, well, we we share some 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 thought about his philanthropotatos characteristics. Mm -hmm. uh, just that. Yeah, I, I think I I would certainly freely grant that Cyrus is one of the amazing things about Cyrus is his ability to, you know, to inspire willing obedience, right? I mean, willing obedience is the, uh, you know, the dominant motif in positive leadership as Xenophon portrays it, I think, right? That's that I, I think we've all come to come to see that in recent years, right? Um, and I, I think I wasn't as fully conscious of that as I should have been when I was writing this paper, in part because I hadn't I hadn't uh, read Vivian Gray's book, which hadn't been written yet. Um, although I, I'm sure I could have found it elsewhere if I'd looked hard enough and thought hard enough. Okay, now I'm trying to read the question of Matias. Uh, I think he can hear us, but he has really troubles with speaking. So if you let me. Uh, my, my question is aimed to one of the aspects marked in the paper as a flaw in Cyrus' performance as a king or ruler, uh, or a ruler leader. This aspect, the argument uh, that the military reform and their inherent unstable nature were a main factor in the future decline of the empire. The arming of the commoners changed the egalitarian education and social order of the peers into that of meritocracy, and the creation of the cavalry altered the old age nature of Persia and corrupted with, his, with the Hebrews or pathos-driven nature of the centaur, and through the metaphor, uh, that of the Medes. However, we see that these two reforms take place during different stages, stages of the campaign, the, the military campaign. A campaign, let us remember, that started as a defensive move from the Persian, Persians to help their allies repel, repel possible future enemies of Persia if they ever succeed at media. The commoners are armed to enlarge the initial defensive army, but also with great concern from Cyrus that they shall be accompanied, educated, and so to speak, guided by the peers to become like them and fight well. He doesn't leave it to chance that they may grab the weapons and fight. 
he knows they need at least a tiny bit of education that the peers have earned through the years. Something like that happens to the cavalry. At the moment of its creation, Cyrus is uh, the best. Sorry, I hear some noises. Cyrus is at the very least not happy with the way their ally cavalry handles the looting and plundering after the victory. So he thinks, what could be better than being us who ride on horseback? We don't need them, and that's good. And here's my point. It is the reforms that, uh, that were inherently bad, or do the unfolding of events play a bigger role? Time-wise, these reforms together cannot coexist. The peers need time to educate the commoners in their ways, but they also need a lot of time to learn and master the technique of writing. The twists and turns of the circumstances could be an important factor to account for when evaluating the impact of the measures. My, la must, my last question, however, has to do with Plato, of course, with the idea in mind that Xenophon could have a critic view of Cyrus' rule. Does do Plato and Xenophon have a common interest in education as a main component in good governance? Is Xenophon being underestimated as a voice in the political and educational field of, of his time? And that's the question of Matthias. Yeah, a, a lot, a lot of interesting stuff there. Um, yeah, I, I agree with, and I, I I think I discussed this in my paper, although I'm not, I'm, I'm having trouble recalling exactly what I made of it. Maybe we're getting at the, I'm already starting to run on fumes here, but the, um, uh, the Persian infantry wins the battle, first battle against the Assyrians, but by the time we get to the battle of Thumbara against Croesus, the Persian infantry really is, plays a negligible role in that battle, right? Um, at that battle, it's, they're pushed back by the Egyptians, and that's the battle of all the siege towers and outflanking the outflankers and all this stuff. Um, so the army, uh, I, I agree, I think, with, with, with Matthias, that we see the army kind of going through a couple of different transformations. Um, and the first one not being, uh, uh, not sticking, really. Um, and... Uh, I'm not 100% sure what to make of that. I think I gave it kind of an ethical reading. Um, I'm sure that others um, have given it more of a sort of a, have approached it more as, as Xenophon kind of having fun thinking through different kind of tactical arrangements, right? And, and just uh, thinking through different ways of uh, kind of, playing soldier right and thinking of how you could how you could win battles with different kinds of features and i and i i guess i feel there's kind of got to be some element of that going on too um but it, it is true that the this this bulking up of the the, the the persian infantry um doesn't seem to be playing a decisive role in the in the last great battle that that cyrus picks and that is, that is curious um as to education, yeah, I, I'm very happy to agree that it's, we, we need to think more about Xenophon and uh, and that he he deserves a, a seat at the table when it comes to educational theorists in antiquity. Um, and the Cyropaideia, uh, you know, is, is obviously a, an integral part of that. Um, one of the, the I think questions to the Cyropaideia, regardless of the origin of the title, which I I've forgotten if I ever knew much of anything about um, is just how central a theme education is uh, in the work, um, because it is, is this true of many of Xenophon's titles, uh, or at least the titles that are attached to Xenophon's works. Um, it, it, it doesn't seem to, it's not the most obvious title, right? Um, so I'll, I'll leave it at that. And let anybody else chime in who wants to. There's a last question uh, of a PhD candidate from Calgary, but she was unable to connect. But I think that Laura maybe can read it as loud. I don't know if she have the question. Yeah. 
uh, Marie-Hélène Trepanier asks, in your article, the eventual fall of Cyrus's mayor after his death seems to be a proof that he was unsuccessful. However, at the very beginning of book one, Xenophon talks about how all types of constitutions, monarchies, oligarchies, democracies are often overthrown and replaced with something else. Also, the degradation of Cyrus's way, ways, sorry, is only mentioned quickly at the end. So I was wondering if Cyrus's empire shouldn't be seen as part of a cycle even more because his reign was possible because of very specific elements, the political and personal and familial context, his education, his personality, and therefore because it's almost impossible to replicate. I was wondering if he shouldn't see his hybrid empire as a transition phase between what was before him and what will be after him, in which case the short life of what he created was actually expected and therefore would not be a criterion to, to evaluate his if his reign was successful or not. I don't know if I... No, I, I think, uh, well, let me say this. I think... Um, <laughs> Uh, if 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 Cyrus is the answer, then um, to the question of leadership, then you know I would expect something other than what we get in eight eight. And I mean, what Xenophon claims is that right? Uh, I have it open in front of me, right? Uh, not memorized, right? That uh, um, you know that th after he thought about Cyrus, he was he was forced to change his mind and and come to the conclusion that um, ruling of 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 humans was not one of the impossible things or one of the difficult things. Right? If you went about it knowledgeably, um, now that doesn't necessarily say that a knowledgeable leader is going to be able to produce a regime that's going to outlive him. Uh, I, I'll grant you that, um, but I, I think it is. Um, I mean, surprise, surprising at a minimum, right? That um, that Cyrus is not as exceptional apparently as Xenophon portrays him at the very beginning. Um, if, if, if his, if his, if we're to take eight, eight is showing that, um, that his success ended at the moment he died. Um, but sh just to return to your quote, uh, at the premium and to mm -hmm. give some, uh, backup to Maria Len, mm -hmm. uh, he, he, uh, said that the main, main issue is that uh, even those who manage to uh, lead a political system even for very short time are considered fortunate fortunate and wise so he's using the example of cyrus as a guy uh, a leader a ruler who achieved rulership a lot during his time life uh, he's not saying that well, I, I saw Cyrus as an example of a founder of a big dynasty that is going to be perfect uh, along many centuries. He only said, well, this is the guy that has some knowledge that allows him to rule during his life. Yeah, there's no direct contradiction between the, the Promium in 88, I think, in that in that sense, right? This is there's a Xenophon stresses the spatial extent of Cyrus's empire rather than its temporal extent, right? Yeah. So um uh but I um you know I, I obviously I'm I'm not the only one to find eight eight surprising, right? <laughs> to, no, to, oh, of to to go to go back to that, right? So um uh and if if we're to if the lesson, or if one of the lessons of the Cyropedia we're supposed to take is that um, even the best leader, right, can do nothing to 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 improve the the, the well being of his followers after his death. That's a pretty dark lesson. Of course it is. Yeah. Of course it is. And Xenophon, as many people have remarked, right, is is much more is seems to be more interested in leadership then in like constitutions and regimes right um and and you know uh and so you know there's some 
some truth to that, but the but the 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 but the stability program, which seems to be what Cyrus tries, is that yeah, laws and institutions are are not essential. Leadership is well. Then you train the next generation of leaders, which he tries to do, and fails. He tries to. Well, he 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 tries to teach his sons right something right, and you would think that he was trying to. He, he, the, 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 the elites in his court are being, you know, uh, educated and, and, and they're supposed to maintain their, their values, their encratea and all their other virtues. Um, and yet, so that Cyrus does have some interest in stability and some interest in the, well, you know, he maybe belatedly, maybe that's just kind of a, 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 a Result but of the, I, the strange I, I, narrative, he he does have he tries to ensure the stability of his regime after his even, death. Even 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 if if I go to accept that he tries to educate his sons through the last speech at the moment of his very last <laughs> minute of his life. <laughs> yeah. uh, even 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 if if I accept that. Uh, mm -hmm. I think that, that it is very important to stress that the, 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 the education and the, the permanent education of, of somebody over his, uh, his uh, students are very important. I mean, for example, in memorabilia, the famous uh, quotation about a uh, pa passage about uh, Critias and Alcibiades. The the main issue is that they learned uh, they uh, lost touch with uh, Socrates and his teaching, and therefore they lost he, the, their uh, soprosune, right? And maybe this is the same case. Their children, Cambyses, uh, was uh, the, the main heir, uh, was Sophron during the life uh, of Cyrus and wh when he dies, well, he lost that because he uh, didn't have this teacher to remind all the time what he must do. And this is exactly what happens with Critias and Alcibiades. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I briefly addressed that in my in my opening remarks, right? And I and I, you know, I think it's yeah, it's, yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. it's an important parallel. I, I, I grant you that, but um, again, I, I guess I just um, uh, well, I, you know, I mean, if if Cyrus, if Socrates did no better than Cyrus, then then right, then what grounds do we have to criticize uh, Cyrus? I guess as a way of generalizing your yeah. argument, but. Uh, Xenophon points out that that Alcibiades and Critias were not the only followers of Socrates, right? And he points out a lot of people that at least he claims were were, were successful. Now we can, you know, debate about that, right? Um, whereas Cyrus seems to have comprehensively failed in education of his of his not only of his sons but of the whole society. It just goes poof. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, uh, <laughs> I think I, we're I all going poof right now, by the way. I want to say so many things, but uh, <laughs> it, it's, it's very late, and maybe there are some other, other questions, and maybe we are very tired. I know for Gabriel. <laughs> I, I don't know what time is there in Israel, but I think it's very late. So yeah, it's ten o'clock here. <laughs> okay, but that's but that's early. <laughs> I, I was wondering what this what would be the criterion for a successful transmission of education, because as Claudia mentioned at the beginning, and uh, Dave just claimed as well like even Socrates was not able to do it and yes even if he had more success with some people with some of his disciples than others like even from the point of view of the disciples what would be have been that successful transmission if they are not if there's not 
even core in which they will all agree that they are Socratics other than having had uh, a relationship to those learnings. So if, if that's how we are going to measure it, is there actually a way to measure that? Well, I think, I mean, I uh, contrast maybe the, the, the Spartan Constitution, the chapter 14 of that with the end of the, of the Cyropaideia. Okay, and again, we're missing Noreen again here, but um, a normal reading of the, of, the, of the Spartan Constitution is that like Lycurgus was great. He set up everything wonderfully way back in the mythical past. And then very recent, recently, things have gone to hell because the Spartans have conquered this empire. They've sent out Harmosts and Lycurgus, you know, all this. Okay, not like uh, Lysander, sorry. Um, whereas in the Cyropaidea, it's immediate. At least everything t takes a turn for the worse immediately. Now, does it get? You you could read the eight eight to see it is is not it. Everything doesn't immediately get as bad as the 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 decline is not instant, but it starts instantly, right? And that's what I find difficult to square with the positive reading, right? Why not say, well, of course we all know the Persians of today are corrupt, right? And over the generations there was a slow falling off from these wise you know, the things that Cyrus put into play, right? So, so, um, sorry, sorry to play the advocates, David, David advocates, but it, it, at chapter four, 14, we, we have, I mean, we have uh, the most part of the constitution of Las Lemonians mm -hmm. uh, being uh, uh, praised to Lycurgus, uh, etc., and so on and so forth. And suddenly we have this chapter that said, well, at, the, at, at, at one point, immediately, the Spartans change because they forgot their costumes and their traditions. And this, that's exactly what happens with uh, mm -hmm. Persia. At one point, uh, they change. And this transformation is not emphasized in the Constitution of Lacedaemonians as being a, a long time process but merely uh, just a moment when their costumes change. I mean, we, we have the context of the, of the, uh, of all the rich, uh, the, all the, the money and the richness they got from the Peloponnesian War uh, and all these changes that are going on in Spartan society. So maybe maybe we can we can we can read the 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 chapter four, fourteen as uh, in the in the very same way as uh, as the last uh, chapter of book eight of Cyropedia. We don't know exactly the 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 time the the time frame of of the transformation. We are simply speculating. Yeah, but there's no, there's, it doesn't have the immediate language, right? Elfu is just, as soon as he died, things took a turn for the worse, right? We get in second. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I totally accept I, that. The, 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 the impression on the reader is, is indeed uh, sudden. It's, it's shocking. It's jarring. Okay. And that, yeah, that's, yeah, yeah. So the, the parallels are, 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 are there as well, obviously. And, um, uh, but the, the, but the immediacy is, 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 is not. And, uh, uh, you know, I, Noreen reads. Noreen Humble reads the the whole. The you know she thinks that the seeds of that are are present from the beginning in Sparta. Okay, and on her yeah pretty dark reading of the Spartan Constitution, right? So um, uh, so I'm actually you know yeah it, lucky she isn't here in that respect. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, I, I, of course, the thing. Uh, Noreen have a family issue and yeah, well, uh, just. One thing that we haven't addressed today, and I don't propose to now because uh, I need to need to bail shortly, is um, that uh, we haven't talked about the Etikai Noon statements, right? All these statements were still to this very day, right? Yeah. Uh, which which are uh, really mysterious to me uh, in terms of how we are to, and uh, I haven't thought about it very hard, and uh, but but that uh, gives you yet another kind of time problem. Uh, for the yeah. same idea. Mm -hmm.
Yeah, yeah. You th I think the, 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 the time issue is a uh, is a very important thing, as as Matthias point out uh, on another issue, on another topic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. That we used to forget about those those things. Yeah, it's a very strange work temporally, right? Because it, it really focuses on. I mean, maybe it's maybe it's not strange amongst the works of Xenophon because it's that it's true of like the guess allows too, right? Where you have this a lot of very detail, detailed attention to a certain sh relatively short period in the life of Cyrus, right? His youth and then that year or so on campaign. And then poof, you go to the, you have this, yeah. these generalizing passages about how he tries to maintain the empire and then he's on his deathbed, right? Um, uh, so there are, you know, the narrator is is doing in, what strike us at any rate is, is being, he's being very aggressive in his management of the temporality of the, of the tale. Yeah. Well, temporality is your segue, is my segue, although I'm not master oh, okay, ceremonies, okay. but I, I'm supposed to, I'm supposed to uh, be Zooming with my family, actually, in a few yeah, minutes. Yeah, yeah, we, so, we, um, we, yeah. We, it's we my, a, lot, a lot more of time that, that we have, that uh, I thought of. But I, I wanted to, uh, I'll, I'll let you sign off, but let me just thank, thank everybody for really a rich set of questions, right? Um, which uh, we, we couldn't do justice to all of them, although I think we got most of them in, which is impressive. And, uh, and so thanks again to Rodrigo and to everybody for, for organizing this. Um, I was pleased as punch to see people uh, actually reading this argument, this article 15 years after it was written. It's, I, I suspect it's, its readership has tripled in the, la in the last year or something all time. Uh, and so I, I thank you for that. And I, I, I thank you all for the, the discussion and the questions and the comments today. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, final words. Uh, thank you all for being here. It was, uh, as Dave said, really awesome to meet with so many friends and have this kind of scholarly discussion, even in this period of crisis. I know it is not the same of being face to face, but at least we have some few hours of talking about Xenophon and his philosophy. And for me, that was great. Really, really great. Uh, it was a real pleasure to see all of you, and I do hope we can meet again in person as soon as, po as possible. Okay. So, well, bye bye, and thank you all. Bye. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Rodrigo, if you.